this entire problem with inflation and what may or may not be a looming recession is a self-inflicted wound. Really what the Fed should be saying is, we're not targeting 2% inflation because 2% inflation is in a normal environment. What they laid out in their projections was essentially the absolutely perfect soft landing scenario. Obviously the recession, a recession will happen at some point. If you think that we have a recession in six to nine months, the downside from here is substantial. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Ramos, and Tom Keen on a Tuesday, a holiday lengthened work week. We're thrilled you're with us. John Farrow, a much needed true vacation. And Kaylee Lines in for John Farrow uh, through the week. And that is a good and beautiful thing. Lisa Bramos, I want to stop the show. And what I learned on my sojourn of a four day weekend is it's real simple inflation is here and it's here in spades. That's what Janet Yellen seemed to say. And it's going to continue for the remainder of this year and after. Increasingly, when I look at the equity notes, it's not about whether there will be a recession, Tom. It's about how deep that recession will be and how much is being baked into equity valuations already. The measurement of recessions, eight ways to go here. We'll discover that across the arc of this week. A little bit less economic data maybe than in normal weeks. But but Lisa, I mean, we can we can play this game all day. It's it's a new game. The price of milk on a moving average study is up 66% off of the pandemic uh, lows. And, and Lisa, everybody's got their own story on inflation. What is the story for Jerome Powell? What is the story for Jerome Powell as he heads to Washington for a testimony in front of the <clears throat> Senate tomorrow and then the House uh, the day after? How can he talk about combating it with a sledgehammer rather than a scalpel? Because this is increasingly the question, what damage do they have to do to the economy and to the labor market in order to get inflation, in order for, to get the price of milk? Uh, down to something more reasonable for a lot of people, Tom. And what's amazing here, Lisa, is, you know, before I get to Kaylee and the world she's living here, I'm doing some math here on what you care about, which is Manhattan luxury rents. <laughs> They've moved five standard deviations. <laughs> it, it, Lisa, it's not really? only... It's, it's not only the new inflation, it's the rate of change, the speed, the rapidity of it. We've moved 5.1 standard deviations on Manhattan rent, that according to Miller Samuel. As relatable as luxury housing in Manhattan is to the rest of the nation and, frankly, beyond, this is just one measure of a whole host yeah. of issues that we've been looking at with housing. And this is a broader issue, not just Manhattan or South Beach and Florida issues, but how quickly does it roll over in order to uh, really see some of the softening and some of the inflationary inputs into rent? And that's an issue as mortgage rates go up to 6%. I mean, we got to look, Kaylee Lines, at some of the data coming in. It's sort of a nudgy day in the data, but, Kaylee, did you survive the weekend with what BitDog did. <laughs> well, I definitely was glued to the price action all weekend. It was Tom, amazing. The other I was, thing I was yeah. doing over the weekend was moving to Brooklyn because I literally got priced out of Manhattan, Tom. So it's a very real thing. I certainly have felt it. Lisa was talking about, though, what the ramifications are going to be of getting inflation under control. I thought Larry Summers' remarks from over the please, weekend, 5% please, please. unemployment for five years, yeah. he says, is what mm -hmm. is necessary. Is that something that the Federal Reserve is going well, to tolerate to get prices in check? I'm glad you bring that up, Lisa. Let's talk about that Kit Jukes writing from Athens this morning with Sockgen, of course, and he equates off Phillips' curve that... The summer's 5% story is 10 million people looking for work. Is that a social policy we can do? I don't think so. I don't Lisa. think so. I don't think yeah. so either. And a lot of people pushed back about whether that would actually be necessary. And there was a lot of controversy over his comments, not only 5% for five years, it could be 6% for two years and then uh, going back down the other well, years or 10% for one year. It doesn't matter. These are not feasible numbers. And that's the reason why you see Joe Biden coming out with possible proposals to spend. Really, the issue is, is there any appetite? type for either fiscal and monetary policy support at this issue, at this venture, and I don't think that there is, which is one reason we're seeing bear cases that look a little more extreme yeah. in certain Joe cases. Joe Matthew to join us from Washington here, I believe, uh, in a bit. Let me do the data check right now. It's a lift to the markets. We sort of felt that over the last four days uh, with the Dow up 65 points. Good morning, John Farrell. It's always important to quote. Uh, the Dow up 479 points, I should say. SPX up 65 uh, points, giving me a 1.8% NASDAQ uh, move. The VIX at 30, that's a big deal, 30.24, a better stock market with a yield elevated 3.27% on the 10-year. Oil lifts, but nowhere near that 124 Brent level, 116 on uh, oil. And dollar churning here this morning. I'm watching yen 
135.47. We need to get briefed out in a four-day weekend. She canoed like 40 miles this weekend. <laughs> you know, Lisa Bram was briefing. I love it. Canoed into luxury housing. I'm trying to put all the images together that Tom puts on me. 10 a.m. This is what I'm looking at. Existing home sales are expected to come in much softer. A big decline. Really? We have seen this. Lower volumes of sales. When does it translate into lower prices for those homes? Because that has not happened yet. Uh, we did see from Capital Economics that that is the expectation expectation that we will get a uh, start in a softening of prices. But how long does it take before it really bleeds into the rental picture and to the broader inflationary yeah. reads? Today we hear from uh, Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin as well as Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester. How much do they signal that the market's gotten ahead of itself? How much do they have to ratify what the market is currently pricing in in terms of a quite hawkish uh, monetary policy uh, pot path for the Federal Reserve? And at 7.50 p.m., I got to say, going back to the yen, Tom, this is what I'm most interested in. The Bank of Japan monetary policy meeting minutes come out for the month of April. How much do they talk about the weakening in the yen, the fact that we're still near those record lows or at least well, going back uh, to the early 2000s, given this policy right. divergence between Japan and the rest and of the you know, world? we got to stop here, folks, because this is off the radar this morning. I want to get to Russ Kostrich. But, Lisa, your chart on radio, it's real simple. You've got a controlled chart. And then in March, it breaks, and it's nothing but a weaker yen. And I, I agree, Lisa, in international economics, this is the debate right now. And it's certainly what a lot of traders are trying to position for, uh, fighting the Bank of Japan, because this does feel completely unsustainable. But they're going to move at their own pace. Do they give any tea leaves in uh, these uh, meeting minutes about when they might move or what the threshold will be, Tom? Yeah, uh, Twitter with a, the with a headline out moments ago. I'm trying to get that uh, out right now, I, I saw it, and then it disappeared in the vast gerbil making that we do. Twitter files proxy statement for special meeting. And, of course, that's off of Mr. Musk's interview with our John Micklethwaite that we saw in Doha here in the recent hours. Finally, Russ Kostrich with his portfolio manager, BlackRock Global Allocation Fund. Russ, what's the dynamic right now of allocation? Are you guys really thinking hard about new reallocations or is it stasis? Good morning. You know, it is stasis right now. Uh, you know, Tom, as you know, we've spoken about this in past broadcasts. We brought the risk in the portfolios down pretty substantially at the end of 2021, and we've kept it down. And practically what that means, we've been running a very light position on bonds, We've been lightening up on the equity side. We have a lot of cash in the portfolio. Uh, it's It's been what you had to do this year because obviously, outside of natural resource stocks, there are not a lot of things in the green. And while I think that the market is a lot cheaper and we're in the process of making a bottom, this is a different type of market. It's a market where the Fed is working against you, financial conditions are tightening, and that means you need to be patient. And Russ, you view long dollar as the best equity hedge. For how long, at what point do you see this kind of losing its luster in terms of a hedge? Yeah, you know, Lisa, it's a great question. You know, it has worked very well year to date. Uh, the dollar uh, measure of the DXY is up around 8.5%. I think the reason it's worked is because the, the source of risk for equities, more often than not, has been the Fed. And when you have these days when there's a rate spike, when rate volatility goes up, uh, you've seen the dollar move up as equities have moved down. Now, is that going to be as effective going forward? Maybe not. Uh, and part of the reason is it's not just the Fed. As we've seen, there's pressure on the ECB. There's pressure on the Bank of England. There's pressure on the Bank of Australia. A lot of countries right now are playing catch up when it comes to getting inflation under control. Well, you mentioned the Bank of England, the chief economist over there, Hugh Pill, out this morning saying that he will sacrifice growth in order to cut inflation. And that seems to be the trajectory that the Federal Reserve on is on as well. That's the reason why Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley, for example, says this market is not yet accurately pricing in the economic contraction. He says 15 to 20 percent more downside to around 3,000 on the S&P 500. What's your view on that? You know, we're, we're not that bearish. I, I certainly would acknowledge you can have more downside, as I said a moment ago. This is not going to be the type of, you know, 2010s market turnaround where you have one day and you can declare the bottom. <clears throat> Having said that, I do think we have to take into account what's already happened. Uh, you've already seen that valuations, depending upon the market you're looking at, are down 30 to 40 percent. So multiples have already corrected quite substantially. 
The other point is, you know, we're debating recession, no recession. It's also worth debating if you have a recession, how severe is it? Because that will determine the path of earnings. And our view is, even if you were to get a recession, uh, it's likely to be a very mild one. So the hit to earnings is probably not as severe as summer discounting, yeah. which means I think the 3,000 call is probably a little too aggressive. Russ, thank you so much. Russ Kostrich with us. Really good to hear from him with a broader allocation strategy at BlackRock. Uh, Lisa, Edyard Denny is going to join us today. And we went out, we got the surveillance Rolodex out and said, who has gray hair and actually remembers inflation? There's not many cards in the Rolex, Lisa. I'm sorry, you know. I, you know, I, I just mean, want to issue up an apology I, to Edgar Denny if he listens. I, he listening and he thinks come on, the closer he's is with James Tobin. He's studied, Seriously? Oh, come on. He's studying with James Tobin at Yale. Hey, he's a giant. We got to get your Denny. Lisa, express inflation in the Bramowitz house. I'm going to express it in the bill I got this weekend from the Levi store to keep afterthought in wardrobe of 501 jeans. What was the inflation story at the Abramowitz house this buying, weekend? Gr buying groceries for the weekend and seeing a <clears throat> bill that normally was $110, $170. Exactly. That it, to I, me, it's yeah, very exactly. basic. Exactly. It's real. It's, you know, okay. Going to whole paycheck. And Lisa, what was great the about paycheck. Folks, Kaylee Lines moving to Brooklyn. The moving trucks extended <laughs> the entire length of the Brooklyn Bridge. It was amazing to see four or five. How about the inflation of moving, Kaylee? Tell oh, me Tom, about don't it. even get me started. Not just the movers themselves, the new furniture, the groceries to restock, the fridge, the new cleaning supplies. I mean, I have spent so much money on Amazon in the last call it weak. exactly isn't that true oh man and, 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 and what 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 uh jesse does there folks he hides it in a separate sub account <laughs> that you don't see for three hours good morning to amazon the lines household making you uh do be uh, do better this week stay with us ed yardeni coming up later this is bloomberg Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Elon Musk sees a recession in the U.S. in the near future. The Tesla and SpaceX CEO spoke to Bloomberg News Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite. A recession is inevitable at some point. Um, as to whether there is a recession in the near term, um, I think that is more likely than not. Uh, it certainly isn't, a, it's not a certainty, but um, it appears more likely than not. The interview was with Musk was part of the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha, powered by Bloomberg. President Biden says he hopes to decide this week whether to move to suspend the federal gasoline tax. That could ease the impact of soaring prices at the pump. The move likely would require congressional sign-off and could not be taken by executive action. U.S. gas prices now average $4.98 a gallon, just short of a record set last week. Russia warns that two Americans captured while fighting for Ukraine could face the death penalty. A spokesman for Vlad President Vladimir Putin tells NBC they weren't likely to be protected by the Geneva Conventions as prisoners of war. Moscow considers the Americans so-called soldiers of fortune and not part of the Ukrainian army. And in the UK, the biggest rail strike in three decades is underway. Unions rejected a last-minute offer from train companies. Some 40,000 workers are walking out today, Thursday and Saturday. That's bringing commuter services to a halt and threatening to cause transport chaos in London. And Mondelez has agreed to buy Cliff Bar as part of a plan to boost its snack business. The company will pay $2.9 billion for the U.S. organic energy bar maker. Cliff has operated for almost 30 years and is family and employee owned. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month and all year long. I was uh, talking to Larry Summers this morning, and... Uh, there's nothing inevitable about a recession. The president of the United States there on Mr. Summers and a lot of vetting out there. Lisa, do you think it's tangible? 
of talking within a normal change of an administration that Lawrence Summers could find a warm spot in the Biden administration? That would be pretty controversial. Can you imagine someone coming I in who counts just, basically yeah. the likelihood of a 5% unemployment rate for the next five years right. is highly necessary? I mean, try selling that to right. the American people. Uh, we're going to get to that right now. But first, a public announcement by Bloomberg Surveillance, of course. It's the Lines Moving Foundation. Send in your contributions <laughs> as you choose. We'll be taking contributions over the phone. We'll be doing that starting at 2 p.m. this afternoon as Lines Moving moves to Brooklyn. <laughs> right now, Joe Matthew with us. He doesn't know where Brooklyn is. It's Brookline, Brooklyn, whichever it is. And he joins us in Washington as well. Joe, seriously, Lawrence Summers has done a lot of public service. They love him. They hate him. I don't want to get into that. But is that the kind of name bandied about to reinvigorate the president's administration? Boy, that would be something. I don't know that Larry Summers is looking for a job like that. But I think that we do have to step back from this story a little bit and actually look a, a bit more closely at what the president said. If we kept playing the tape there on the beach as he was talking to people yesterday, he went on to say, after the not inevitable uh, remark, I think we're going to be able to get a change in Medicare, he said, and a reduction in the cost of insulin. It's not that Joe Biden thinks he knows more than Wall Street or knows better than Larry Summers or Elon Musk, for that matter, but he thinks there's still an answer to this, a legislative answer that could come in the form of reconciliation, something Democrats can pass on their own, a mm -hmm. stripped-down version of Build Back Better. I know you're tired of hearing about it, but it looks like they will take an their swing at that wow. ball this wow. summer. I don't know if that does wow. anything, though, to prevent a recession. For those of you across the nation, and I know you've got your own Brook uh, cities as well and international, we're making jokes about this, but there's Brooklyn, there's Brookline, and I guess there's Brookland as well in Washington, D.C. Those <laughs> span a lot of different economies, Joe. That's and, true. And I want to talk about who's not being talked about, which is the broader middle class right now. How bad is the agony for the broader middle class, and what can the politicians do about that agony? I'll add Brooklyn, Connecticut, where I once lived as a young boy, and that is a working class area. It's agriculture. It's manufacturing. This is not the New York side of Connecticut. And people going to the store over the weekend, in many cases, are buying chicken. They're buying hamburgers. They're leaving the steak, or maybe they're splitting the steak. I'm not sure exactly how that goes. But this is so real that you've got a president who's out there talking well, about this on a daily basis with a war raging, with, uh, with a pandemic that still has not been controlled. It's the number one issue here. And if he does what Larry Summers is talking about, 5% unemployment uh, doesn't, you can cut that into a couple of different things, by the way, a couple of years of 10%, right. he said, maybe it's three years of seven and a half. That, that's a wipeout for Democrats. That That is not a story that well, you can tell in going into 24 for re-election. Joe, what does prescription drugs and the prices therein have to do with substituting chicken for beef? Well, that's another issue we're talking about here. Headline versus core. What prices can they actually affect? We heard from uh, Jay Powell talking to Mike McKee last week who said, look, you know, there's not a lot we can do about oil and food prices here, but we're going to go after what we can. And that's been the story from the White House, trying to defer to the Fed, but also doing what it can through legislation, and it does require legislation. There's not very much that this president can do through executive order. That includes the idea of gas rebate cards right. they're talking about or a suspension of the gas tax. That's got to go through Congress, and it's just not clear that the votes are there. How much appetite, Joe, is there truly to do some sort of fiscal spending package at a moment when a lot of people are still pointing to the fiscal spending of last year as something that turbocharged the inflation that we're seeing today? Right. That's, it, it looks like a deal breaker. To tell you the truth, uh, between now and November, I just don't see the appetite. The House can do a lot of things with its relatively slim majority for Democrats. The Senate is another matter, though, and unlocking a lot more money to stimulate the economy is not going to get a, a yes vote likely from the Joe Manchins or Kirsten Cinemas of the world. Remember, we don't even have legislation to talk about here. These are concepts right now, Lisa. And finally, while we're talking about concepts, we heard from Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla and SpaceX at the Qatar Economic Forum in conversation with Bloomberg's editor-in-chief, John Micklethwaite, talking about 2024 and whether he'd be supporting President Trump in that race. He said <clears throat> he's undecided as to who he would back. Do we have to get through the midterms before we have a clearer picture of the presidential race coming t about two and a half years from now, Joe, or are we going to start getting yeah. some clarity on that sooner? <laughs> well, you just said it, two and a half years. Yeah, we need to wait a minute here. Look, a lot of people are <clears throat> trying to gauge the 
the Trump impact on the midterms, and we have a couple of big ones as well. So keep an eye out for, for Liz Cheney in a few weeks. We haven't uh, resolved the January 6th hearings. We've got the next one out today. It's unclear if Joe Biden's going to run. It's unclear if Donald Trump is going to run, although he's certainly acting like it. But yes, we have to get through the midterms, and we have to see where the economy is going to be next year and what hope this current president might have for a second term. And my goodness, right now it's not looking great. A lot of folks think that he's not even planning on that because of his age, but he says publicly he would love to run again against Donald Trump. Uh, Joe Matthews, thank you so much for the update. We'll speak to you again in the next hour uh, as well. Uh, Lisa, as you well know, there's a, there's a sell side tone to every note. There's a Mike Mayo feel to a banking note. And there's this that Oliver Chen writing up the recession this morning. And, and Lisa, uh, it's a classic Oliver Chen note with a lot of verve at Cowan about Alta, which is beauty products. And he is heated that it's recession resistant. And there's a moat around it because of the sale of lipstick. I, I mean, love it. It's recession classic resistant, Oliver Chen. Waterproof resistant. <laughs> you know, uh, there, what, my, one of the tones that I noticed in a lot of notes over the weekend was what's been priced in already. And yes, how yes. much have we priced in a deep recession in certain stocks? And how much have the safest stocks, the discretionary or the non-discretionary rather, uh, basically been bid up so high that that's a no-go zone, that they're no longer safe, that those are the most expensive areas. Increasingly, <laughs> I'm looking at people pricing in scenarios that are incredibly gloomy and doomy. So at what point do we realize that we've gotten to some sort of nadir here in terms of sentiment? I agree. Where then we pop. I'm not being optimistic. Don't don't, no, you know, no, not, we don't, don't, do don't that. accuse me Fair of that. Have to but, come back from vacation if you but, do that. but you just have to wonder. I mean, how much gloom can people take before you start to take a step back well, and say is, what's been thrown out with the bathwater? Really well said. It's it's extremely important, folks. This is the heart of the matter as we do surveillance into June and of course into July in the 27th uh, meeting. Kaylee, to that point, Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley, the recession drawdown already is 60% of the gloom is their math. Well, and he says it has farther to go. 3,000 is the level he's looking at on the S&P 500, but I would note he's not alone in that. You also had Peter Oppenheimer over at Goldman Sachs saying that the market is pricing in only a mild recession, so it's vulnerable to any further deterioration in expectations. But while you have the consistent, <clears throat> those on the more bearish end of the spectrum, the bulls are still out there. Marco Kalanovich over at JP Morgan says too much recession risk has been priced in. There is a pretty wide no. divergence on the outlook here, and I wonder how much of it is ultimately going to come down to whether earnings are able to hold up, and we'll start getting a look at that in just a couple weeks. Tom. That sets up the debate with futures up 66, down futures up almost 500 points, 490 and 3, and the VIX comes in in, uh, in 0 0.81 points, 30.22. Please stay with us from New York. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance, we say good morning to you. Right now, futures up 67, a nice buoyancy. I think we felt that through the weekend, uh, uh, a, a better feeling to the tape. NASDAQ up 1.9%, uh, Dow up a solid 500 points with a VIX of 30. And that feeling was there and the bounce and all that around the recession gloom uh, that was out there. Uh, we didn't see that Kaylee lines in for John Farrow. We didn't see that Kaylee in crypto. The emotion, Kaylee, of an under 18,000 print on crypto over the weekend. Yeah, a level that was very closely watched by those looking at the technicals was more around $19,000, and that didn't hold. What's interesting, Tom, is yes, you saw that plunge into levels we haven't seen in literally years, yet you're seeing a ferocious rebound mm. over the last couple days, up 16% yeah. on Sunday, up another 4% or so today. We're back north of $21,000. You know yeah. we'll be taking a look at that on Bloomberg Crypto at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Kaylee's Not a promo in time. Oh, thank you. Kaylee's entourage said you've got to sell this. Here's what I'm going to sell, folks. There's a massive amount. Lisa and I live this every day of crypto babble out there and the show that Bloomberg's put together with Kaylee Lines leadership is really trying to have an intelligent conversation away from the fanboyism of Bitcoin. They're working at that every week and of course in the emotion here. Lisa, I saw uh, over <laughs> the weekend uh, in Korea they've limited the travel of one blown up 
crypto operators. Yeah, this is going to be an ongoing <clears throat> story. I keep going back to what Pete Shear said. We talk about crypto as sort of a side project. How much is it a more central project in terms of the economic ramifications, yeah. considering the energy, considering the people who are getting rich quick? I mean, how about all the cab drivers you had who talked about whether they should invest in right. Bitcoin, Tom, and what that does when it doesn't go up anymore? We all have a reading process to get briefed really right through the weekend, reading Saturday and Sunday as well. And part of that is the work of Carl Weinberg at High Frequency Economics with a brilliant note this weekend gauging recession likelihood. Holding up his court in the United States is Rabila Faruqi, who joins us now, the chief U.S. economist at High Frequency Economics. When you hear politicians blather about recession, Rubila, how do you listen to them and how do you gauge the guessing of a, of a recession and the quality of that recession? Yeah, good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, we're really looking at the fundamentals. We're looking at the economy and right now there's no really real signal about a recession. Having said that, what the Fed is doing in terms of how rapidly they are ratcheting up interest rates, uh, you know, in our discussions we find that this, you know, it's a very atypical uh, rate hiking cycle and it's going to have uh, pretty serious ramifications for the growth outlook. Uh, the, the further the Fed goes and, the, you know, the aim uh, for most central banks right now is to get to neutral. And in our view, uh, getting to neutral is not just getting to the longer term uh, rate that is being, you know, that's set at around two and a half percent, but that interest rates are going to have to move higher. And that has, uh, you know, that's going to have uh, pretty significant, uh, uh, you know, implications for the growth trajectory going forward. Rubila, the interest rate story perhaps is the old story. The new story is whether the unemployment rate has to rise to unimaginable yeah. levels in order to achieve the uh, price dampening effect that a lot of people are hoping for. What do you make of uh, Larry Summers' idea of 5% unemployment for five years or 10% unemployment for one year or some of these catastrophic, unimaginable numbers? Yeah, and, you know, I do think that uh, for uh, the U.S. outlook, we should expect, given what, what the Fed is signaling in terms of rate increases, and they're also acknowledging it in their <clears throat> forecast, how far up we go and what is acceptable, it's really unclear right now. But, uh, you know, in terms of a 5% uh, unemployment rate, that's not really <clears throat> outrageous uh, in terms of, you know, what their longer run mm -hmm. uh, unemployment rate is. But, you know, a 10 percent uh, unemployment rate, that's where the issue lies or, you know, even going above 5 percent. Right. So I do think that we're going to see a, a, a move up in the unemployment rate. How far up it goes and what the tolerance is, is still unclear. I, I, you know, 4 percent rising above that is not out of uh, and, the realm of possibilities. And Lisa, while you and I are at the grocery store enjoying aisle six, uh, the 30 year bank rate mortgage did what Julia Coronado was talking about, a print of six 0.01% on Monday. T to me, Lisa, that is the statistic of the morning. Especially because we do get a slew of housing statistics that do show a slowdown. But at what point does that translate into something that means a lower CPI inflation read? Rubila, we are looking at rents that keep climbing and will probably keep climbing even still, even as home prices come down, because people are getting priced out of that market with a 6% mortgage handle. How much are you looking at rents continuing to climb and CPI remaining far higher than people expect for far longer. Yeah, and that's a very major part. You know, we've talked about housing uh, and, you know, the bounce from housing and how that's going to continue to feed into uh, the CPI numbers. And if you see house prices, mortgage rates are going up, demand is going to come down. It's already coming down. But if you see prices, if that doesn't ease significantly, that that's going to feed into rents because people, as you said, are being priced out of the market. So, the, the, the push from rents, the push from that component is probably going to last longer, uh, you know, uh, for some time. And I think that's going to keep the inflation, especially core inflation, higher than uh, uh, would normally uh, we would expect at, at this point of the cycle. But, uh, you know, I think uh, what we expect on mm -hmm. the services side on the core inflation is that a lot of this demand for things that people have not been able to do over the last two and a half years or so, I think that is going to abate over time. And what we expect to see on the other side of, let's say, the summer or September or October is some easing of those pressures. But again, like you said, rents are such a large component that it is probably going to provide a lift uh, to the inflation statistics for some time. 
Okay, Rubila, so if I'm an average middle class American, I am looking at potentially the value of the home I own going down, that price moving lower. At the same time, I'm keeping an eye on my 401k and I see how much my wealth has been destroyed in just the last couple of months. That is likely feeding into the ways that we've seen sentiment deteriorating, and yet you haven't seen the data deteriorating to the same extent. How long is that gap going to hold? Are we going to start to see some real more material deterioration in the economic data and spending, for example. Yeah, and that's the base cases that for now, you know, you, we still have pent up demand for things like, uh, you know, travel accommodation, uh, you know, going to movie theaters, going to concerts, those things are going to continue over the next few months. People haven't done this, you know, really engaged on a wider scale in these activities for a very long time. But I do think that once we move past that, and that we don't not really certain when that's going to happen, but it's probably going to take a few months for that to filter through. But you have people who are households that are facing not only higher gasoline food costs, but also, you know, r rapidly higher uh, ratcheting up of interest rates. You know, credit card uh, rates, uh, mortgage rates, and all these things are going to, uh, you know, feed into the outlook. And I do think that, you know, as consumers run down their savings as they rely more on lines of credit, that those things are going to feed into uh, slower spending over time. Okay, so how does that come down to your forecast on the odds of a recession, Rabila? Over at Goldman Sachs, they, they say 30% chance this year, 48% chance to, uh, over the next two years. What do you say? Uh, I do think recession risks are going up each time the Fed moves, and the Fed moves very aggressively. You know, we went from 25 to 50 to 75, and we're expecting another 75 in July, and probably another 250 basis points after that. So that really is going to slow the economy down in a very, very uh, substantial way. So I, the recession risks are definitely going up. 30% recession risk is not out of the realm of possibilities. It's, it's a pretty reasonable estimate, and I think as... If the Fed remains as aggressive, I think those re recession risks rise with each move. Rubila, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. Rubila Faruqi with us with High Frequency Economics uh, today. And, and uh, Lisa, I, I, I look at where we are in inflation, and of course, we haven't talked much about it. Good morning to those of you across the United Kingdom with real serious issues a rail strike pushing back 30 years. And the partition, Lisa, it's less about a more higher paid rail driver than it is about station staff and railway cleaners. And you put out the Wall Street Journal article today, and it's in all the zeitgeist, including Bloomberg, of inflation and what it means for teachers or nurses or railway cleaners and staff. Some of these people are just giving up given the speed of this inflation. And there's some idiosyncratic issues depending on the field and depending on some of the dissatisfactions. With respect to what I was talking about uh, with this Wall Street, Wall Street Journal story is that there has been nearly a 3% drop in the workforce of teachers and support staff in public schools around the country. And that means about 300,000 people who decided not to come back to work. I hear this all the time, Tom, and I, it hits really close to home with teachers leaving the workforce. It's been a really exhausting bunch of yeah. years. They are not paid as much. People are exhausted. There's been the scars of the COVID crisis with kids that people still don't talk about to the extent that a lot of people are living it, Tom. And of course, there's lots of legislation on this, and this folds into what we're talking about with economics, finance, investment. Kaylee Lyons, just one of the proposals, this from the uh, Very Liberal Economic Policy Institute, of New York City minimum wage wage going out to an Amazon-like level, which is $15, very different than Virginia, very different than other parts of the country, out to a stunning 21.25. You wonder how Jerome Powell has to adapt to that. Yeah, does that mean kind of that wage price spiral that everyone so fears, Tom? Right. But the fact of the matter is there is a difference between the minimum wage and a living wage, and there is a difference between a living wage, uh, especially in this kind of inflationary environment when you aren't seeing real wages going up enough for people right. to keep up with the higher prices at the pump, the higher prices at the grocery store. Tom doesn't want to buy beef anymore because prices are high. And, Tom, you're a TV news anchor. <laughs> for people who make hourly wages, minimum wage, what are they doing in this kind of environment? Okay. It's got to be really difficult. On the 
the flip side, and, and Tom, weigh in on this, but we actually see certain small businesses curtail hiring plans because they can't afford the wages that people are well, demanding. These are is the that dynamics. the path? Right. Is that the path to higher unemployment? How painful is that when a lot of these companies say, we just I, can't even I, provide the services because we can't hire the people at an affordable cost? You can't. First of all, we've never faced this before. No. I want to make clear this inflation we're talking about is different than what I knew in my youth. The railway strike in London is different than what John Farrow knew in his youth as well. It is original territory, and we'll give you some good perspective on this. Again, Ed Yardeni will be joining us. Coming up in the 7 o'clock hour, our John Micklethwaite in conversation with Elon Musk. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden has reiterated that a U.S. recession is not inevitable. Biden spoke to reporters after a conversation with former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers. Summers says there's a chance, a significant chance the U.S. will find itself battling stagflation. Bloomberg's learned that the European Union's 27 members are set to formally grant Ukraine candidate status later this week. That is a highly symbolic step on the long path to becoming an EU member. EU leaders will discuss Ukraine's membership bid this week. In China, the coronavirus outbreak is shifting to its south coast. A flare-up in Shenzhen has triggered mass testing and a lockdown of some neighborhoods. Meanwhile, gambling hub Macau is racing to stop its first outbreak in eight months. And it is the latest move in the battle over who will end up owning Spirit Airlines. JetBlue has raised its offer to buy the bargain carrier, valuing Spirit at about $3.7 billion. That follows Spirit's decision to delay a shareholder vote on its pending deal with Frontier Airlines. That vote is set for June the 30th. Elon Musk says that Tesla will cut its salaried workforce by about 10% over the next three months, but the number of hourly workers will keep growing. In an interview with Bloomberg News' editor-in-chief John Micklethwaite, Musk said Tesla grew very fast on the salaried side. The interview was part of the Qatar Economic Forum, powered by Bloomberg. Armand Les has agreed to buy Cliff Bar as part of a plan to boost its snack business. The company will pay $2.9 billion for the U.S. organic energy bar maker. Cliff has operated for almost 30 years and is family and employee owned. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Last year, our unconventional uh, oil production in the U.S. grew by 25 percent. We expect to grow 25 percent uh, this year. I think thoughtful conversations about uh, investments across that whole portfolio of solution sets needed to provide affordable and reliable energy while reducing emissions is the path forward. Darren Woods, he is chief, chief executive officer of the First National Bank of Exxon Mobil, uh, was, was what it was called, over the years. To give you perspective on Exxon, consider $306 billion coming down to an 18% EBITDA of $55 billion. I'll let Kaylee Lines figure out what that means per day that Exxon is minting now at $5. A gallon gas. I should point out, uh, am I right, Lisa? Gas is a little bit lower maybe yeah. than the last couple of days. Yeah, it's come down a little bit. And this <clears> comes <throat> as we hear a growing number of proposals from Washington, D.C. Right. My favorite aspect of the gas rebate card story is that this administration has struggled to get enough cards because of the chip shortage. So they haven't been able to produce as many cards in order to get the rebate. It just shows how multifaceted this problem that we're in uh, really is. Yeah, very good. Matt Miller just emailing in. Matthew Miller noting it's Tuesday, Tom, you idiot. Thank you, Matt Miller, for that. And that means a crypto show today. I was wrong. <laughs> Not tomorrow. Kaylee Lines, there's a lot to talk about on Price of Crypto and the agony out there. Seriously. Yeah, there definitely is. And whether or not the bottom yeah. is, in fact, in at this point, Tom, if the rebound we are starting to see take shape is actually sustainable, if this right. is a viable dip. But, Tom, when we talk about wealth destruction, yes, $2 trillion was wiped off the market cap of U.S. equities last week. There has been major wealth destruction in crypto right. as well. And a lot of retail is in this market. That's not great for sentiment. And there could be ripple effects uh, stemming from crypto to broader financial right. conditions, which is something that Ben Eamons over at Medley Global Advisors was talking about this weekend.
Bloomberg, as a hydrocarbons team, truly second to none. Javier Blas giving immense perspective there. And also Julian Lee, to say he's a Bloomberg oil strategist, barely uh, mentions his academics and excellence out of London. Julian Lee joins us this morning. Julian, I love your terse essay about Exxon, big oil, and the little guys running the gas stations, they're the blame right now. Why is Exxon on down to the petrol station outside London? Why are they not to blame for these high prices? Well, I think, I mean, you, you have to look at this globally. There's an awful lot of pressures on the prices. I did an analysis of uh, petrol prices here in the UK. Um, about 47% of what we pay at the pump at the moment goes straight to the government in in. Uh, two different taxes, um, and including a tax on the a, a second tax on the first tax, um, they take almost half. Uh, another, round about a third, maybe a little more, uh, is the cost of the raw materials, the crude oil, uh, the biofuels component that go into making the gasoline, and that in the end leaves about a margin of, of something like 16% uh, to cover the transportation costs, the refining costs. Uh, the distribution margin, uh, the wages of, of the people who work in the refineries and drive the trucks and work at the, the pumps. Um, and that's really not where, where the problem is. The problem is uh, that we are suffering shortages of, of both uh, gasoline and diesel. Yeah. Um, the, the supply isn't there. The demand is growing more quickly than anticipated on the recovery from COVID. Um, and you know, still everyone uh, looking at perhaps staycations rather than flying at the well, moment. That's where I wanted to go, Julian. How much of that demand destruction are we actually seeing aside from uh, big policy prescriptions in, in Germany, such as please yeah. stop using so much gas? Yeah, I mean, the part of the problem is that at the moment we're really not seeing enough of, of the demand destruction that we need to balance the supply and demand of these fuels. And this is one of the problems I think that, that governments face and whether it's, it's uh, the Biden administration in the US or whether it's our own government here, uh, there's a lot of pressure to cut taxes on uh, road fuels yeah. to help ease the pain. The problem with that is that if you start cutting the price, all that does is stimulate demand. And if prices are rising because there isn't enough supply to meet the demand, the last thing you want to be doing is stimulating even more demand. Well, um, so there are, governments are in a real bind on this. Julian, that's exactly where I wanted to go because we did hear about this also from the United States. We've heard about this from the United Kingdom as well, about removing some of the gas taxes, which frankly are a lot less uh, significant than over in the United Kingdom. How big is the swing factor in terms of demand? In other words, how low are inventories to make even just a small decline in demand make a real difference in terms of bringing down uh, prices? Well, U.S. gasoline inventories at the moment are... Uh, at their lowest for this time of year for, I think it's about seven years, so since about 2015. Um, and, it's, and, and they're heading lower as, as they traditionally do at this time of year. The problem is that, you know, they started um, the, the summer driving season at a relatively low level anyway. Um, and, you know, you're talking about, I think, the... the, the uh, the federal tax on gasoline is about 18, 18 and a half cents uh, a gallon. That's that's not a big drop in price, really, um, in terms of, of, you know, the overall five dollars a gallon mm. price. Um, and the problem is, as I say, that the, the immediate effect of that is going to be to uh, create a little bit more demand uh, or, or to forestall any any reduction right. in demand. And that's simply as, and we saw this in the UK in, in March when there was a tax cut here, that uh, the tax cut was passed through, but almost immediately uh, the prices kept rising because of the underlying pressures in the market. Right. And perhaps governments need to look at a more targeted uh, set of help. Well, Julian Lee, thanks for the brief this morning on an eventful week for oil. Brent crude right yeah. now, one fifteen eighty seven, up a dollar seventy four. West Texas, one twelve a barrel. Still not used to those uh, prices. It's time for the Abramowitz brief. We do a Bramo brief on corporate markets, IG and high yield. Lisa, I went back to the BAA industrial to the ten year, which is what fossils used to look at, and it's very like spiky, like 
There was a little bit of angst, and we de angst. Why did we de angst? This is technical. Uh, this is technical Very analysis. Spiky. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and whenever you say Brahma brief, I feel like I should do jazz hands. Um, we did see a little bit of a bid to the tape, and this comes as Bank of America came out last weekend and said that buy junk because it's going to be ready for a violent rally. And how much do people take a look? It yields eight and a half percent yields average for junk bonds and take a look at the 5% yields yeah, that they what's were the default a couple years risk? ago. What's the default risk in recession? Come on. Okay. Give me your, give me your inner Marty Fritzen right now. What is this recession going to look like? How long is it? How deep is it? Because the parameters of uh, the ranges of what the losses could be are dramatic. If it's a short-lived recession, a lot of these companies have already baked in all of the financing they need over the next three years. They could ride it out, right? If not, you have a real problem because you have companies that have financed themselves on 4% coupons that are looking suddenly at 7 8% coupons. This is not a sustainable financing uh, mechanism, and that's why you've got such a wide divergence of views. Lisa Abramowitz and Kaylee Lyons with us. John Farrell, incredible. Where did Farrell go? I mean, he is went he... to Capri. I... He goes there a lot. He, he goes, goes there all the time. Wasn't he there like last really? week? Really? Yeah, he, he goes to Capri. We all should be so lucky. It's, just, it's like speechless. Oh, I know. It's that one with a view. Stay with us. That Future's up 68 with... points. Good morning. This is Bloomberg. This entire problem with inflation and what may or may not be a looming recession is a self-inflicted wound. Really what the Fed should be saying is, we're not targeting 2% inflation because 2% inflation is in a normal environment. What they laid out in their projections was essentially the absolutely perfect soft landing scenario. Obviously the recession, a recession will happen at some point. If you think that we have a recession in six to nine months, the downside from here is substantial. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramus, and Tom Keen. Thank you on a, sh a holiday shortened uh, work week. Tuesday, crypto report today. Kaylee Lines before her crypto show. In for Jonathan Farrow. We'll get to BitDog here in a moment. Lisa, everybody's talking. Over the weekend, the zeitgeist was clearly, uh, clearly recession, gauging recession. We're going to do that with Ed Yardeni here in a moment. How much is a self-fulfilling prophecy, as we heard some of the commentators talk about, given the fact that really the University of Michigan uh, sentiment survey seemed to be one of the deciding factors for the Federal Reserve to go big uh, and to go big possibly again next month. How much are we looking, though, at a shallow recession versus a deep one? And really, that is the question right. that we're really morphing into. And what's important here, Lisa, and I never understood this. I mean, I'm not a commodity expert, but they call it live cattle. But it ends up in aisle seven in Whole Foods, whole paycheck is dead cattle. It's up 60% off the pandemic at lows. We had milk earlier up 66%. This is the inflation into this recession debate. Tom, I can always tell when you've gone to the grocery store because it's sort of this renewed shock at the different <laughs> aisles and how much more things have gone up. So you come in with your anecdotes about milk and about beef. What's and your you're anecdote? Right. What is your thing in the grocery store that mattered to you this weekend? What I was looking at were cans, cans of soda that normally are eight ounces. I saw them for seven and a half ounces. Who's uh, ever heard of seven and a half ounces? And that, I think, is that shrinkflation, this sort of small areas right. where you get less for spending more. In the debate here off of our Fed show the other day, thank you, folks, for the comments on the Fed Decides. Really, really appreciate uh, the guests that we had. And, Lisa, what was so important to me was the Atlanta GDP number, which, frankly, is not a recession, but is at near the zero mark. The the reason why we keep talking about what Larry Summers said is not because we think Larry Summers is going to be right at a 5% unemployment rate for five years or a 10% unemployment rate for one year. And what the higher rates in order to address inflation lead into in terms of the jobless rates. But how much pain do we have to take to bring these prices down? We don't have a feeling that this is going to be a transitory shift in inflation with even Janet Yellen talking about that. It's a game changer, Tom. If you're starting to talk about deliberately inflicted uh, pain on an economy right. at a time when there still is a lot of wounds that have to be worked out from the pandemic.
pandemic. Uh, very quickly, Kaylee, we've got breaking news. Let's go to Bitcoin quickly. 21,000, 18 to 21,000 in the last number of hours. Is that a buy on the bottom? Well, that's the question. The bottom maybe was hit over the weekend, if that's the case, Tom. Right. But we'll see whether or not this is sustainable. On the subject of breaking news, you see the headline out of Kellogg? I see that out of Battle Creek, three, Michigan. Three independent companies spinning off its U.S., Canadian, and Caribbean cereal and plant-based businesses. The stock up more than 6% in pre-market. I've had discussions over the years with Carlos Gutierrez, of course, who modernized Kellogg to a great extent about this. I mean, at the Lines household, are you are you partaking in toasted cornflakes every morning, Kaylee? My preference is Special K with red berries, and they actually have it upstairs in the pantry, Tom. If you want to, well, check we it do out. that up in the pantry. But 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 Lisa, this is something. This goes back to 1906 in cornflakes, and there it is. They like others are under pressure to do something. Yeah, try to immunize the different places. I wonder how much we're going to see other uh, attempts to also deal with the strong dollar and how much that starts to weigh on certain companies right. and try to immunize them from some of the weakness in other parts of the world. Quick, quick data here to get to Dr. Yardani. Futures up 65 right now, the VIX 30 level. Yields are up fractionally. I'm going to call the 10-year yield 3.27% worth watching uh, this morning. The real yield, the 10-year real yield, 0.67%. Some stasis in foreign exchange. I'm watching yield Again, right now, rounded up to 136. That gets my attention, 135.75. Uh, we need to do a morning brief, though, first here. It's very important that we get briefed here. What are we briefing <laughs> on this morning, Lisa? I'll whip through it so we can get briefed by Eddie Ardetti, who has a lot of really important words on inflation and some of the dilemma of the moment. 10 a.m., we get ex existing home sales. This is expected to soften somewhat substantially as we see mortgage rates climb beyond 6%. How much does this feed into lower home prices? A lot of people are waiting for that transmission mechanism, which is not necessarily that clear cut, given the strength of the economy and the lack of supply of houses. Today we hear from Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin, as well as Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester. I want to hear what they have to say in terms of the unemployment rate. What will be a trigger for them to move away from some of their policies in terms of tightening? And at 7.50 p.m., Tom, you mentioned the yen. The Bank of Japan issues their monetary policy minutes from their April meeting. How much do they really look at the weaker yen as a major concern for them, given that it is something that everyone feels is unsustainable? They have a policy of negative yields and pinning yields where they are, yield curve control at a time when the rest of the world is suddenly seeing the extinction of negative yields. Tom. And now our conversation of the day on your fear of recession. Edward Yardeni joins us. He's president at Yardeni Research, but far more than that, decades of experience in the ebbs and flows of the American economic experience. Experiment. Ed, we just saw Carlos Gutierrez Kellogg say enough. We're throwing in the towel. We're breaking up an underperformer in Battle Creek, Michigan. In recession, in the gloom of recession, Ed, isn't the rule always corporations adjust? Well, I think everybody adjusts in a, in a, in a recession. And uh, what, what's interesting is uh, if uh, we are in a recession or we're going to have an imminent recession, uh, as you know, Tom, this is probably the most anticipated recession of all times, uh, which in my mind makes it either less likely or if it does occur, uh, it's going to be uh, a, a fairly uh, short and, uh, and shallow recession, uh, which is kind of uh, where I'm leaning towards. At this point, I, I don't think a recession is yet inevitable. I've got a 45% subjective probability of a recession happening over the next 18 months. Uh, but I've been raising that uh, assessment as as everybody else has been. Ed, let's go through some of the components, starting with gas. Yes. And with $5 a gallon gas, let's say it goes down a little bit, but stays around here. At what mm -hmm. point is that the trigger in and of itself in terms of how right. much it really crimps consumer spending? Well, you know, it's, it's a, uh, a tricky situation when you look at uh, spending by all households. It's about 4 or 5% of all households' uh, budgets relative to personal uh, income. Uh, however, when you look at it on a per household basis, uh, we were spending about $2,800 a month on average per household about a year ago, and now we're up to about $5,000 per month. And I should say that's at an annual rate. It's not per month, it's at an annual rate. Uh, in other words, at the price of $5, uh, if it just stays here, we'll be spending $5,000 on average per household, and that hurts especially lower income uh, households. Now, some of them 
have had some pretty substantial wage increases, but the, unfortunately they've uh, seen that they've had to give them all back at the grocery store and uh, filling up with gasoline. So um, the, the gasoline situation is definitely an issue. And it's, as you mentioned before, it's really one of the main reasons that the Consumer Sentiment Index has taken a dive to an all-time record low, especially the uh, expectations component. So consumers are depressed and they're depressed about inflation generally and gasoline prices and grocery prices specifically. And I'm wondering how that is going to translate into corporate earnings, because as we talk about a consumer faced with higher prices at the gas pump at the grocery store, they are spending less on certain discretionary items. We've seen that with the warnings out of the likes of Target. How much broader will that extend, Ed, as we approach the second quarter earnings season? Well, that's a good news and bad news situation. Uh, the, the bad news is that uh, uh, some of these retailers are getting stuck with lots of inventories of consumer discretionary uh, categories. And uh, the good news is that they're going to have to clear those uh, inventories by cutting prices. And as you know, one of the uh, most significant components of inflation over the past year has been consumer durable goods right. inflation. And that's going to come down, especially all the housing related uh, items. So um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's contributing to a slower economy. On the other hand, it's going to probably mean that the inflation news is going to be somewhat better than expected over the rest of the year. And you're Denny, given 28 flavors of recession, is your study of history that all central banks remain data dependent or do they throw in the towel and blink at some point? Well, I don't see a Paul Volcker out there. Let me let me start out with the extreme. I mean, uh, you know, back in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, Paul Volcker said, you know, dang it, I got to I got to bring inflation down. The only way that's going to happen is if I let interest rates go up to whatever level it takes to cause a recession and bring inflation down. And, and history does show, uh, certainly U.S. history shows that uh, the most effective way to bring inflation down is to have a recession. A really hard recession will do it for sure. Uh, I don't think the central banks want to go there. They've spent uh, the past couple of years trying to get uh, their labor markets protected from the pandemic. They don't want to suddenly completely reverse that around. Uh, so I don't think we're going to see uh, these central banks uh, uh, tighten in a way that causes the kind of uh, right. recession we had in the 70s. Uh, but they are tightening. There's no doubt about that. And the, the fact of the matter is the financial markets have uh, tightened even more. So uh, cr credit conditions are slowing mm -hmm. the global economy down. And I think we're going to see a peak in commodity prices here pretty shortly. Ed Yardeni, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. With oh, some real op thanks. tangible optimism there, Yardeni, at research this morning. Kaylee Lines, I just did a moving average study. And folks, I really want to make clear we're not doing buy, hold, sell on surveillance or on Kaylee's Bloomberg crypto uh, either. But Kaylee, I I'm looking at two moving average studies of BitDog down 50 some percent and another one down 20 percent or so. And what within that study, what's amazing to me is to get back to resistance is 27,000. That's how far it's fallen. Yeah, it's a long way away, Tom. And it's obviously not contained to just crypto anymore. You obviously saw a deleveraging in that space. But in terms of the ripple effects, Ben Emans over at Medley Global Advisors pointed to some research out of the IMF. The spillover of price volatility of Bitcoin explains 14 to 16 percent of the price volatility of the S&P 500. This market has ramifications across other asset classes. We're going to continue here through the morning. Uh, futures up 61, Dow futures up 445 to VIX to uh, 30 level. 30.34. Please stay with us. Kaylee Lines, Lisa Robinson, Tom Keen. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The world's richest person says that a recession in the U.S. is likely in the near future. Elon Musk told Bloomberg News editor and chief John Micklethwaite that it's not a certainty, but a recession is more likely than not. The Musk interview was part of the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha. President Biden says he hopes to decide this week whether to move to suspend the federal gasoline tax that could ease the impact of soaring prices at the pump. The move likely would require congressional sign-off and could not be taken by our executive action. U.S. gas prices now average $4.98 a gallon, just short of a record set last week. Russia warns that two Americans captured whilst fighting for Ukraine could face the death penalty. A spokesman for President Vladimir Putin tells NBC they weren't likely to be protected by the Geneva Conventions as prisoners of war. Moscow considers the American so-called soldiers of fortune and not part of the Ukrainian army. In the UK, the biggest 
Rail strike in three decades is underway. Unions rejected a last minute offer from train companies. Some 40,000 workers are walking out today, Thursday and Saturday. That's bringing commuter services to a halt and threatening to cause transport chaos in London. And Kellogg plans to split into three independent companies. It will separate its North American cereal and plant-based food businesses via tax-free spin-offs, along amongst them its global snacking business with more than $11 billion in sales. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month and all year long. The recession risks are going up, partly because monetary policy could have pivoted a little earlier than it did. We do have growth slowing. Um, to a little bit below trend growth. And we do have the unemployment rate moving up um, a little bit. And that's okay. Loretta Mester of the Cleveland Fed, one of my favorite Fed presidents, the mathematician Loretta Mester, very good at counting the beans of recession worry across America. If you're just joining us, Kellogg, Battle Creek, Michigan, 31,000 employees, all that heritage of the American breakfast table. Did they do Pop-Tarts, Lisa? I can't remember. Did they? I don't know. It's something that goes within the tang and the Velveeta that you talk about every morning. No, so. I do. The tang and a Pop-Tart is one way to start oh, yeah. the, <laughs> the, the morning. Anyways, uh, Kellogg up 9 percentage or so. Yeah. They're going to split up. And Lisa, over the last 10 years, the performance is a moldy 7 percent per year. That's what gets it done, isn't it? You know, Please don't talk about breakfast and moldy in the same sentence. It's still 7.18 a.m. <laughs> Eastern, and that's a little bit alarming to me. This is about being tax-free or having a sort of tax-advantaged units, and I really <clears throat> do wonder how much, aside from that, it's also looking at immunizing some of the risks from slowdowns in specific regions yes. because there is a huge <clears throat> bifurcation right now in terms of the recovery in different parts of the world. In the autumn of 1964, the King Kitchen serving tang and Pop-Tarts. <laughs> and everyone My father just got a little indigestion. To <laughs> breakfast. Someone else enjoyed that. The young Joe Matthew in 1964 uh, joins us <laughs> right now as well. Joe, David Goldman is one of my favorite people. He ran research at Bank of America, lives somewhere in the Pacific Rim, writes for the Asia Times. And Goldman is out on a blistering note about your president blaming Matthew, blaming Biden, blaming everybody else for inflation. And he says, baloney, it was a 30% fiscal impulse. The average is 20%. How does the president and how does Washington deal with pulling us away from the fiscal impulse of the pandemic? Well, that's a heck of a question as we consider, you know, more spending to potentially get our way out of this. And there's not much appetite for that on Capitol Hill. But indeed, we were talking about inflation long before there was anything referred to as the Putin price hike. This is something that has dogged the president for more than a year. And it looks like they're coming around with a lot of, I guess, familiar sounding ideas, Tom. The Build Back Better plan that never passed last year could re-emerge with a different brand name, with a more slim down look, new and improved, and might even have Joe Manchin on board. In this case, remembering that he was open to something around one and a half trillion dollars. It just never ended up happening. Lowering the cost of prescription drugs, maybe a, a child tax credit, also investments in energy is what we're talking about here. There are other ideas, though. A gas rebate card to deal with inflation, also <clears throat> the potential for a gas tax holiday. It's interesting the language that you hear, Tom, from the White House, the president standing on the beach there in Rehoboth saying, I'm going to make a decision on that by the end of this week. But it's not really his decision. There's already been legislation introduced to do that very thing on Capitol Hill, and he needs lawmakers to approve it for that to happen. So while, while the White House is having its own conversation, Americans are having a different one. 
I, I look, Joe, at, at the moment. Lisa, help me out here uh, on this inflation front. It's like what to do. I mean, what do you do? It's the same in West Virginia as it is in Massachusetts, right? Inflation's well, inflation. Joe, when we talk about the likelihood of things getting passed, we talked about this earlier about how there's not going to be a lot of appetite to spend more. Will there be an appetite to remove the gas tax, considering some of the pushback saying, well, then you remove the potential demand dampener and just accelerate That's the right. price increases that we see, uh, frankly, every day at the pump? Well, that's that's not something that a lot of people understand, I think, in Washington, or at least don't talk about it. Yeah. Take the gas tax up. Everyone takes a road trip. And now we've got even higher demand and potentially higher prices. I'll tell you another issue here. And it's the reason why Nancy Pelosi is not so much on board. She has looked back and, and, and this was just a few weeks ago, talked about it, that it was a muted impact in, in cases where states, for instance, had lifted the gas tax, also saw rising demand. But here's something else. We've got an infrastructure plan that is just now being implemented to fix our roads and highways. That gas tax helps to pay for it. That's the highway trust fund. So how long are we going to go without keeping our roads and bridges intact just as Mitch Landrieu starts to comb the country trying to make the case for the infrastructure law that was supposed to be the best thing uh, that had ever happened? That was supposed to help Democrats in the polls this coming November. And most people forgot that it ever even happened because a lot of these projects will take years before they begin. Well, and of course, part of what the president also wanted to spend money on was building out green infrastructure, things like EV That's charging right. stations. Where is the climate agenda in all of this as he looks to meet with big oil executives or his team does at least later this week? A lot of that is in the infrastructure law. The charging stations are in the infrastructure mm -hmm. law, as a matter of fact, and that's something that uh, is, is getting money right now, mm -hmm. or we could have, in fact, a network around the country of compatible right. charging stations. But you're asking the right question. How do you balance this call for more oil production while at the same time trying to transition uh, <clears throat> to a green uh, energy environment here? That's part of what we're looking at in this reconciliation bill. It would have investments right. in both, but I think the the, the the point here is that it's not going to happen as quickly as Democrats and progressives might want, and we're going to need a little more oil in the meantime to keep this from being <clears> such a problem. Joe, thank you so much. This is important right now, folks. We do have markets on the move here. Futures up 60. And Lisa, as you mentioned earlier, it is the yen just within a touch of a 136 level. Dollar yen is weakened out. It's been extraordinary from 115 out to 135. And we come up here just in the last number of days, uh, Lisa, uh, we, we come up here just touching near 136, 135.90 right now. Lisa, Nora Rubini in Doha at our uh, summit, yen weakens above 140. He looks for that to finally where the Bank of Japan blinks. Well, to use your phrase, this is the parlor game. At what point does the Bank of Japan have to cave? An increasing number of prognosticators saying that they're not going to cave, that they can work on their own schedule, that they can control this market for a long time. The issue is they even recognize this as a risk. They even recognize that their policy is unsustainable, even as they doubled down in last week's meeting and blew out all of the people who were betting against them. How long can this game of chicken go on, Tom? And that seems to be where the yen is going. And Kaylee, the yen it seems distant. I mean, it's over there. Why do we care in that? It's about the dynamics along the Pacific Rim and instabilities, maybe bringing down the choice set that other central banks have. Yeah, and if it's going to be a problem domestically for Japan, does that have ripple effects? It strikes me, Tom, that while we're talking about the weakness of the yen, you call it isolated, talking about isolated, the strength of the Russian ruble, which is not a conversation we thought we'd be having, say, two, three months ago. And yet that has caught the attention of Russian <clears throat> officials for a reason of too much strength, even in spite yeah. of all of the sanctions and restrictions uh, around Russian assets right now. I'm not going to do a compare and contrast of what is a frontier economy, as the EM guys call it. Damien Sassauer would look at Russia, I think, as a frontier economy versus one of the trade and manufacturing juggernauts of modern civilization. Yen out near 136 is the headline uh, this morning. Futures advance up 62. The VIX 30.32. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.
morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Brownlitz, and Tom King. Mr. Farrow, well-deserved Capri Beckins, Kaylee Lines uh, in for John uh, today. Before we get to Remain, we have yen moving. It's yeah. been a quiet day, and right now, yen almost out to a 136 level. I believe, Lisa, a 24-year breakout yes. to weak yen. Highest, or weak, highest for the dollar versus the yen, weakest for the yen versus the dollar, going back to 1998. <clears throat> and this is a repudiation of what a lot of traders were looking for, which was a Bank of Japan humbled by a market, humbled by their inability to keep the peg, saying, no, we will. And what you're seeing right now is record weakness, at least <clears throat> in the modern era, Tom. Advancing the conversation, Nora Rabini in Doha at the Qatar uh, Economic Forum that, that Bloomberg had. Of course, Elon Musk there as well, talking with John Micklethwaite. Uh, and a lot of eventful stuff. Mr. Rubini is keeping his eye on 140, 140. There's a beautiful chart. On radio, it's enough to tear up. It's such a beautiful chart of weak yen uh, this morning. On individual stocks, he's had his cornflakes. He's had his Wheaties. He followed with a two-pop-tart chaser, Romaine Bostic. <laughs> Hey, good morning, Tom. I see you're on a roll today, and so are a lot of the stocks out there coming, of course, off a really awful week for a lot of these names, the most beaten down names. They're basically the biggest movers that you're seeing in the pre-market. Apple shares right now up about 2% here on the day. Schlumberger, which had actually slid more than 20% last week as part of a seven-day slide, higher by about 3%. But the conversation, as always, with a lot of these upside moves is how much conviction, how much sustained power is there in some of these moves. Interesting note here on Lennar. They actually came out with earnings. Remember, this stock really got hammered last week. Everyone said that big jump in interest rates was going to have a material impact on a, lot of, on a lot of these home builders. So far, no real effect. Obviously, a little backward looking as far as the quarter goes, but uh, in terms of actual deliveries, that was up by about 4%, better than expected. On top of that, the purchase price, the dollar value of all of those sales were up about 20%, and the company said it's going to stick by its full year forecast to deliver about 68,000 homes, though some sell side analysts already out with notes saying that's probably unlikely in the face of rising rates. Nevertheless, those shares up about 4% here on the day. You mentioned our editor-in-chief, uh, John Micklethwaite, over there at a Qatar Economic Forum, Forum interviewing Elon Musk. Interesting commentary by Musk, of course, about Twitter. It seems to be sticking by the deal, though. As always, he has a lot of caveats about uh, what he needs to see in order to see that deal through to completion. Shares up about a percent here, but at 38.28, well below, of course, that offer price. He also talked about his own business at Tesla, confirming those reports about uh, layoffs and a scale down uh, in the total amount of salaried workers as well as mm -hmm. some of those hourly workers. Interesting commentary. Check out that interview on the Bloomberg Terminal. Also coming out of the Qatar Economic Forum is an interesting deal. Exxon Mobil taking a 6% stake in a, a $29 billion uh, LNG export operation in Qatar. This is an interesting move because a lot of these big oil companies now are trying to find sort of alternatives uh, to that sort of Russian Eastern European uh, pipeline that they were also invested in. Now, I guess, looking to some of the Middle Eastern nations and potentially pick up that slack. And the end of an era here for Kellogg. Shares up about 8%. Of course, they trace their roots all the way back to the early 1900s where it was a cereal maker. But of course, since then, it's grown into much more of that. It gets most of its revenue now from snack chips, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, Tom. Kellogg shares on, up 8%, splitting into three. And we should point out, Tom, they're going to have a cereal division. They're going to have a snack chip division. And I'm sure this will be music to your ears, Tom. They're going to have a plant-based Oh, they give me the yeah. touchy feely so, vegan. I mean, I mean, Lisa, come I had a on. Vegan scramble this you weekend. Have the tang, it was delicious. You have the tang yeah. with the frosted choco tastic <laughs> pop tart. Yeah, you're, you're a but it's of vegan, health, so it's all good. I don't know good. which of the three companies that's in, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a mishmash of America. Frosted choco tastic. We should make. We should make clear, folks. A tang is not a property of Kellogg of Battle Creek, Michigan. <laughs> or Blue Bostic, Thank you so much. <laughs> with a close this afternoon with a report on how Kellogg uh, will move forward. Forward. Here's what you need to know, and I've been screaming about this to Lisa's angst. She says, Tom, shut up. Put a cork in your mouth. There's a bond bear market. We love equity, stock market, equity, stock. But when price goes down in bonds, there's a thundering silence. Winnie Caesar has lived this as global head of credit strategy at Credit Size. Winnie, it's real simple. On a blended corporate index, I'm down 16%. I'm down 21% annualized. Is that a bond bear market? It certainly feels like a bond bear market to a lot of investors, but we're also seeing a pretty attractive reset in yields, which is actually getting a lot of attention back into the market. 
where we have investment grade yields that are now above where they were for the peak COVID volatility in March of 2020. So that income generation property is feeling a lot better right now, despite those really terrible total returns so far this year. Which is the reason why, Winnie, why I'm not surprised that you're seeing so many more inquiries from investors. What are their main questions in terms of the parameters of risk and the stress case for some of these names? So the number one question is, does the U.S. or the broader global economy go into a recession? And if so, what does that recession look like? Is it severe? Is it drawn out? Is it more shallow? Is it more of a reset based on growth expectations that are not quite as optimistic as perhaps where we have been during very easy monetary policy and that COVID-driven growth? So everybody's trying to handicap what does the actual outlook for things like downgrades and defaults, because that's where you're actually going to start to see some capital lost in the investment grade and high yield market actually look like, or are we going to be able to kind of muddle through because fundamentals heading into the slowdown are actually in very good shape overall. So given your fundamental analysis, Winnie, what have we priced in already given yields at eight and a half percent for junk and for, uh, for investment grade well north of five percent? So what we're pricing in right now is a much more normalized outlook for things like downgrades and defaults. At almost 5% for investment grade, that's very much an attractive kind of income generation and also compensates you for some credit risk in terms of downgrades. We also have a much longer duration in the investment grade market, which is playing a little bit of uh, complication into valuations because much lower coupons means that bond prices have to fall a bit more to get you to that higher yield. In the high yield market, we have a distress ratio. So issuers that are kind of stressed, perhaps facing some economic challenges in the future that has risen, but not necessarily risen to a level that coincides with a massive uptick in defaults overall. And so we're really pricing in kind of a more normalized default environment, call it the two to 3% area over the next 12 to 24 months. So Winnie, is essentially what you're saying that we're not going to see enough stress within credit markets that the Fed presses pause or at least takes its foot off the accelerator? I think that that's probably a fair assessment, at least for now. The Fed is very focused on whether or not capital is flowing into the credit markets when issuers need to raise that capital. And so far, what we've seen is issuers are able to come to market and price deals. Now, these are at much higher coupons or borrowing costs than last year, but deals are still getting priced fairly efficiently. And instead, what we're seeing is that most issuers have done a really good job of pushing out majorities, of locking in really low coupon debt last year in the second half of 2020, which means that there's a little bit less to do on the issuer side of things. And that gives the Fed a little bit more air cover to continue to tighten policy. So what are your expectations for issuance, considering how we saw so much of it over the low rate pandemic area? But as you say, borrowing costs are now higher. How many more companies are going to want to come to the debt markets? So for the next six months, we are expecting that issuance is going to slow down compared to the first half of the year, especially in investment grade. That's a very typical seasonal pattern. We tend to get a little bit slower back half than front half. And this year, what we saw was a lot of financials driven issuance in the first half of the year. And most years, most of those financials aligned issuers actually price the big bulk of their new issue in the first half of the year. In the high yield market, I think that the borrowing and new issue is going to be a little bit more dependent on what happens with spreads and yields. For right now, the bulk of higher rated, so double B right. high yield issuers, they have very little to do. And it's more on a kind of need to, to borrow basis that we're going to see the right. single Bs and triple Cs come to market. Kaylee, got to run with the breaking news. Kaylee Caesar, Winnie Caesar, there, excuse me, Winnie Kaylee, I'm sorry, brain freeze. I was thinking <laughs> about Chucktastic Pop Tarts. Winnie Caesar, thank you at Credit Sites as well. Lisa, we are through 136 on uh, weekend. Two standard deviations out is 137.94 on its way to Rubini's 140. How much is this a reassessment of how far the Bank of Japan is willing to go after they surprised on Friday by not giving any nod to the pushback they're getting from people in the FX market, even though you saw short bets 
On the Japanese uh, denominated, yen denominated bonds, you saw the short positions rise to the highest since 2013. Right. Everyone's betting they're not going to be able to handle this. They come back, they slap back the market, and this is what happens. People it, say, no mas, I don't want to hold it. And I think what's so important here, Lisa, we need to explain why international economists, whatever flavor, link together euro dollar yen because we go yen why does it matter other than toyotas and the answer is it's way bigger than that it's way bigger than that both as an economy <clears throat> as well as a bellwether yeah. it has been traditionally a haven currency for the entire global market for this to fall out of bed because there is two different realities there is the reality of the europe <clears throat> and the u.s monetary right. policies where they're saying we have to give yield because we have inflation houston and then you have over in japan saying well it doesn't really matter for us and this isn't the inflation that we want and right. oh by the way uh we can hold it at zero or below right. and it doesn't matter i've been out of touch on this folks i mean i really dropped the ball and surveying. Fortunately, my team has, has researched this for me uh, this morning. Kaylee, I wasn't even un, uh, uh, aware with Kellogg's up 8% that they've appeased like the vegan Kaylee crew with unfrosted blueberry Pop Tarts. That's un American. For the record, Tom, I am not vegan. I enjoy meat and cheese and egg products just as okay, much well, as well, anyone well, other non-vegan. But pizza, will, well, you'll do fine. I do love some pizza. Now, now found in Brooklyn, some. Tom. But of course, as you see Kellogg splitting <clears throat> into these three different businesses, they're talking about how, in part, this is a reflection of the fact that they are no longer just a breakfast cereal company; that they've expanded into different categories like yeah. snack foods, things like that. I do have to say, why didn't they name the three businesses Snap, Crackle, and Pop? That, oh, that's so cute. Lisa, I mean, she's just her research. <laughs> you know, what you guys don't understand, Kaylee Lines has comedy writers like Jimmy Kimmel. I mean, it's amazing oh, yes. how she comes up with this stuff <laughs> this early in the morning. I could never do that. Futures up 63. They advance. The VIX 30.36. We're watching Yen 135.97. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden has reiterated that a U.S. recession is not inevitable. Biden spoke to reporters after a conversation with former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers. Summers says there's a significant chance the U.S. will find itself battling stagflation. In China, the coronavirus outbreak is shifting to its south coast. A flare-up in Shenzhen has triggered mass testing and a lockdown of some neighborhoods. Meanwhile, gambling hub Macau is racing to stop its first outbreak in eight months. Bloomberg's learned that the European Union's 27 members are set to formally grant Ukraine candidate status later this week. That is a highly symbolic step on the long path to becoming an EU member. EU leaders will discuss Ukraine's membership bid this week. And Elon Musk says there are still a few unresolved matters regarding his proposed acquisition of Twitter. He told Bloomberg News Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite at the Qatar Economic Forum there is the question of whether the debt portion of the deal comes together and then whether shareholders vote in favour. Musk is still waiting for a resolution on the matter of how many bots are on the platform. And it is the latest move in the battle over who will end up owning Spirit Airlines. JetBlue has raised its offer to buy the bargaining ca carrier valuing Spirit at about $3.7 billion. That follows Spirit's decision to delay a shareholder vote on its pending deal with Frontier Airlines. That vote is set for June 30th. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. A recession is inevitable at some point. Um, as to whether there is a recession in the near term, um, I think that is more likely than not. Uh, it certainly isn't, a, it's not a certainty, but um, it appears more likely than not. Often in the news recently, Mr. Musk of Tesla, SpaceX, maybe of Twitter, I'm unsure on that. 
He in conversation today in an incredibly important uh, forum. It is the second year of Bloomberg committing to support of the Qatar Economic Forum. Simply put, Qatar is different. You hear of Saudi Arabia, maybe the United Arab Emirates and all of the Persian Gulf. Well, the reality is Qatar is front and center, particularly for LNG, which is why we've had conversations there with the leadership of ExxonMobil and Shell as well. Joining us now after his conversation with Elon Musk, John Micklethwaite, who we know will be back in Qatar when England goes to the World Cup. Jamie Vardy leading the way. What is the likelihood, John, that Jamie Vardy can get back out of Lister and help England not embarrass themselves? That is, I agree with you. That, that is the single biggest question of this morning. And um, my hope is, of course, that he will re-emerge. But seeing he's almost as old as you and me, he's, um, he, does, he does face issues in that. And, of course, Bloomberg Surveillance looks forward, Mr. Micklethwaite, to attending the World Cup meetings. Uh, I think I could speak for John Farrell. Elon Musk I may... Know, I think we should all go. Yeah, we should. Elon Musk, with a conversation, I would say, John, by rote, he was very careful. Why was Elon Musk so careful in his answers to your questions? I don't know. I think what's interesting was he did it at 3 a.m. in the morning, your time, which I know is probably just only shortly before you get up. But for most of us, it's quite late in the evening. And um, but, but he was I think he was careful because partly because the topics of his life are quite careful at the moment. He has the Twitter issue where I think he's stuck between the fact that he talked about it very much as someone who'd almost bought it. He talked about things he wanted to do with it and all those things. But I can't believe that the price isn't a significant problem for him. I think he's also got issues back at Tesla. There's this issue of layoffs there where he has to be rather careful because there are lawsuits coming in. And then he's got all the politics um, where he's sort of come out in mild support of DeSantis. But I don't think he's really thought, thought through that much about what he's going to do. So actually, weirdly, for someone who's, who enjoys being a provocateur, I think he's sort of um, he's in one of those phases where he's sort of stabilizing little. Well, and John, there also is this awkward moment where he has to talk about layoffs, job cuts at Tesla, talking about three and a half percent of a reduction across the entire workforce and a 10 percent cut in salaried workers. How much does this indicate a slowdown in the company's revenues in their manufacturing and demand? There must be something there. I mean, he tried to explain it along the lines that. Tesla has grown very, very quickly. But I think there is a sort of risk there. You played the bit at the beginning where um, he asked, I, I pointed out that Biden yesterday um, had said that he didn't see a recession as inevitable. And Musk effectively said that he saw it as likely. Um, and so I think that is in the back of his mind, like it is in the back of just about everybody um, who runs a large business. And on top of that, he's got problems to do with China. I think that's another reason. I think Tom's description of it is quite, quite a good one, is that I think he is careful. You, you, if you own Twitter, what does that do with your relationship to China? In the interview, he points out correctly that Twitter is not kind of allowed inside China, but it's, the Chinese on the whole don't tend to be great lovers of free speech, and Twitter is nothing if it's not free speech. And so I think that's another set of issues for him. If he backs DeSantis, or indeed Trump even, for, for, for the presidency, that would cause real problems with the Chinese, and so on and so on. So I think there's a sort of, there's a set of issues that are looking a little bit more def difficult for Elon at this precise moment, though you might point out that if you start any of those things from the position of being the world's richest man, then perhaps you're not starting from a bad position. Well, and John, on the subject of Twitter, which of course has been a topic of conversation for months now, a saga that is still ongoing, did you get the sense that he has as much conviction or passion or desire to ultimately own that company as he once did, just tone-wise? Is this a man that still wants to buy Twitter for 54.20 a share? Well, that's that's the interesting thing. That, that if you look at the if you look at the sort of deal premium, though, that it would indicate that investors don't think he's going to buy it. They think that it's going to come apart because the the gap is a large one. And Tom Keane has always taught me to look at those things. On the other hand, 
Um, I think he mentally is already in a state where he talks about it as something that he wants to do. I think it's more the price that is worrying him. And I think he is suspicious about Twitter's numbers. I mean, he was rather careful about what he said because he pointed out again that he had legal problems. But he still wants Twitter to come up with more information. And I, where exactly they are on that information thing, we have people who know more than I do. But my understanding is that they haven't given him the sort of crown jewels about what every single detail of Twitter is. John, one final question, if we could, with our commitment to the Qatar Economic Forum, within the politics of the Middle East, there's almost a triangle, I would suggest, between Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and up the coast, Doha. Explain the position of Doha right now within the greater Middle East. Well, Doha is in a very interesting position. Um, there, as you, I think that's a very good description of it. I'd almost say it's a quadrangle because you've also got Iran out there yes, as well. Yes, yes, yes. And the Qataris um, seem, to have rec seem to have recently um, made friends again with the Saudi Arabians, but they have a long issue, a long history of irritating them and vice versa. Um, you have the Arab Emirates, with whom, again, the Qataris don't get on with every single member of those. And you have the Iranians off to one side. I was just talking to somebody, a local Qatari, this morning, just now, and she was pointing out that you know, there are powerful Shias inside um, Qatar, and again, that is something that's different. So they are the proverbial kind of small kid on the block who's trying to sort of play several things at the same time. But they do have one advantage, which, for instance, Dubai does not have, is that they do have energy. I mean, that's the reason why every single mm -hmm. big energy provider is here because this is still an enormous source especially of natural gas and if you look at what's happening in the world economy at the moment with all the worries to do with Ukraine and this idea that we're in a transition to a greener future then anyone who talks about transition is drawn to natural gas well, and that brings you back to Qatar. It is grand theft how Bloomberg surveillance every day steals from the hydrocarbon coverage of Bloomberg News, including Jave Blas and the leadership of Will Kennedy. Stuart Wallace doing so much there as well. John Micklethwaite, thank you so much. Look for his conversation with Elon Musk in small Musk-like portions, but also a larger view as well. Uh, to me, Lisa, the massive thing with Elon Musk is a small German shop called Volkswagen. All of a sudden, there's competition. <laughs> He's going to be facing competition from everyone. Yeah. And I've been passing de Tesla dealerships occasionally oh. on my drives uh, upstate and back. And you can see there are cars actually in the lot, which is surprising yeah. considering the backlog. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, it's when you're Field in research. the H2, you go by quickly. <laughs> We what will continue. We theft? do this with dollar with yen. <laughs> yen a 136.22. This is Bloomberg. Right now, the market is really oversold. The market believes the Fed is going to strangle inflation. We have seen markets continue over the past six to nine months, mark up aggressively the path for their expected funds rate. I think this is an excellent time for investors to take advantage of the carnage. It's widespread, it's deep. We can see the peak in yield. That should be some support for the equity markets over the summer months. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Cracks deepening in the global economy as exemplified by an ever-weakening yen. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, John Farrow off, and Kaylee Lines very much in. Tom, we've got to start with the yen as we see it weaken uh, to the weakest going back to 1998 versus the dollar. There's always a tilief that matters, Lisa, and here it's not only weak yen, it's the rate of change of weak yen, and then the guesstimates about where does this really matter for for our, our, our listeners and our viewers. Nora Rubini in Doha with Bloomberg this morning looks at 140, not too far from a 136. How much is this pushing the Bank of Japan, seeing how far they have to go, and how much does this highlight the strains uh, that are really emerging, that are transmitted through the FX channels as the Bank of Japan keeps its thumb on its bonds? The institution and the culture is stunning. How It's not dated, Lisa. 
it's just so rigid in the process that is something that they're comfortable with, the Ministry of Finance and the Bank of Japan as well, and, of course, the leadership led by Mr. Kuroda uh, at the bank. And I can only say, uh, Lisa, that, that there's, a, there's more a breaking point than a gradual process here. And I would argue that a lot of this depends on how much conviction the Federal Reserve has to go as far as people expect in terms of tightening. Do they have really the appetite to spur a deep and long recession? And Tom, that is really underscoring every analyst note. Are, is there a Volcker, right, to Ed Yardeni's point? Well, yeah, the Volcker part, I think, is overplayed, and Dr. Yardeni made very clear about that. He didn't think, you know, the comparisons to the late 70s, early 80s are there. But I'm looking now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant, Lisa, to say yen plunges, but we're getting close to the use of that word here at a 136.32 new weakness moments ago. And Kaylee, how much are we looking at examining the contours of a recession and what's already been priced in in terms of the gloom <clears throat> of whether we're going to reach a breaking point and the cracks and this and that at a time when earnings are still solid, when you see Lennar, the home builder, coming out with better than expected earnings after losing 44 percent so far this year. Is there a sign with the analyst recommendations and notes that you're reading that perhaps we've peaked in terms of pessimism. Well, that really is the question. You have the likes of J.P. Morgan, who already called for peak pessimism, peak Fed hawkishness earlier. They say that has been delayed, but actually the second half looks a lot better. And Marco Kalanovich over there saying that the recession pricing has actually been overdone at the same time that you have the likes of Peter Oppenheimer over at Goldman Sachs saying only a mild recession is priced in. And Mike Wilson at Morgan Stanley saying for this market to properly price in the economic downturn we're going to see, the S&P needs to be lower by another 15 to 20 percent, all the way down to 3,000. But the earnings question Lisa is a good one because if the market is this pessimistic, if people are this bearish, yeah. does that leave room for upside surprises on earnings or could the earnings story just reinforce all of that pessimism if we don't see margins holding in there in the face of inflation? And Tom, you know that I love gloom as much as anybody else. But the top of the market really is highlighting <clears throat> this feeling that perhaps you can start right. looking in certain spots. You are seeing a lift uh, in both the S&P and the NASDAQ. Yields uh, up a little bit, price down in bonds, but nothing that extraordinary except for for the Foreign Exchange Channel. Foreign Exchange Channel, the Brent Crude 116 gives a little bit of lift as well. Moments ago, the wonderful team of the great, great Greg Anderson and Stephen Gallo at BMO Capital Markets model out 138 on yen and make clear it could go much weaker through 140, even higher than that. That's an important note from a team with great, great experience. Speaking of great experience, Megan Horneman joins us right now, Director of Portfolio Strategy at Verdon's Capital Advice. Uh, Megan, it's my question of the day as we go into mid-year. How have you reallocated? What is the nuance that you've done in the last number of days? So what we've been doing is looking at the portfolio and looking at some of the areas of the market that you had mentioned earlier have, have kind of priced in that peak pessimism. You know, we know recession odds are rising significantly. Um, we think it is highly likely over the next 12 months, but what is the market priced in? And we think it, when you look at some of the areas like the small and mid cap space and also the developed international, these parts of the market have fallen, you know, in, in the U.S., the small and mid caps somewhere between 30, 40 um, percent. This is pricing in a lot of that pessimism. We still think there's some room to go in those more um, high you know, mega cap technology, very high PE multiple stocks. But I think there's room if you can look with, um, within the U.S. equity market and also internationally. Megan, you talk about buying into the downturn and avoiding selling at the lows. How do you do that in terms of what your portfolio is, how it was arranged heading into this downturn? So coming into this downturn, we had dry powder. Um, you know, last year we knew that this market was looking frothy. Um, it didn't have anything really to do from the economic standpoint. We did expect some slowdown in the first half of this uh, this year, but we knew that the market was frothy. So we had dry powder to work with. We've been gradually um, putting money to work in those areas that I mentioned. But you got to be patient. You can't look at this market on a on a day by day or week by week basis. If you look at history, you know, bear markets happen. Um, we're in one right now. 
if you were to enter in when you hit a bear market, that 20% decline, if you look at the long term, returns in the market are still favorable. So you just have to be patient, beware of the volatility, be comfortable with it, and have dry powder to put to work. How much is the optimism that you feel in terms of your purchases hinging on the idea that the Fed is not going to be able to go as far as people think, that there is not a Volcker here on the Federal Reserve and that they're not willing to cause the employment rate, the unemployment rate to rise to 5% for five years? So I think what the Fed's going to do and what we're going to see the recession, the way it's going to form out is just a consumer-led recession. Um, we know manufacturing is still very necessary and needed to clean up the supply chain. So that's going to be supportive. The labor market, as you mentioned, that is still supportive. We still have a pretty strong labor market. I think the Fed's going to have to be aggressive. I think it's going to be front end loaded. We're going to see a lot of that this summer and into the fourth quarter. Um, but I think it's just going to be the consumer that pulls back. And if you go back and look at historically recessions, the consumer right now, um, there's still okay from a um, household balance sheet perspective. Savings have been dried up because of the rise in, in food and energy prices, but debt service ratios are very low. So the consumer we think can come out of this, but it will be a consumer led recession. There will be pullback in certain parts of spending. What about corporate balance sheets, Megan? Corporate balance sheets, they've, they've really enjoyed the past decade of very easy monetary policy. So they've restructured balance sheets. Um, they're in pretty good condition. It's the operating margins that we're, that is very unclear right now. Um, that's going to depend. We'll get a lot more information out of when we get earnings season uh, starting in July and then what they see going forward. But the margin <clears throat> pressure is the biggest concern there. Do you think margin expectations are still too high at this point with about three and a half weeks to go until J.P. Morgan really kicks things off? <clears throat> I do think in certain pockets of the market, like I mentioned, that U.S. large cap you know, technology growth area, there still is probably some room for margin contraction there. Um, but other areas of the market have really priced this in. Megan, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it this morning. Megan Horneman joining us with Verdant's Capital Advisors. He publishes, and it is always a note, and I'm sure you'll see this through the day. You hear it first on Bloomberg Surveillance. Lisa Bramowitz. A guy named Dalio up in Connecticut weighs in. And Ray Dalio with a piercing note this morning, reducing inflation will come at a great cost on the edge of summers and stagflation. And he goes back to uh, Volcker and has the language painfully squeezed and reducing spending is part of the Dalio view forward, Lisa. This is the bear case, and people are saying it might not get to that extreme. A lot of people arguing that it won't get to that extreme. <clears throat> Others saying that's what's going to be required to bring inflation back to that 2% level that the Fed reconfirmed as their goal. The issue that I have is, yes, we heard from Jay Powell, and we'll hear from him again this week, both tomorrow and the day after in, on Capitol Hill, about their commitment to that 2% inflation rate. But when? When do we have to get back to it? In 2035, is that really going to cause a deep recession? Right. Or do they need to get back to it by the end of <clears throat> next year? Because that's going to be an impossibility unless you get some of the pain that we heard about from Larry Summers. Kaylee, Mr. Delio touches upon productivity as a solution. And the word so linked to that is technology. And maybe for the optimistic crew like Ed Yardeni, it's more about technology leading to productivity, which gets us out of this quagmire. Well, but I wonder what that ultimately means longer term for the employment picture in the U.S., Tom, because we talk about it so much. Small businesses that have positions that they simply cannot fill or they cannot pay the necessary higher wages in order to entice those employees to come in the door. At what point do those jobs just go away? Do they get replaced by automation, by technology? And <clears throat> what does that mean structurally for the labor market coming forward, which already looks so right. different <clears throat> uh, during the pandemic? And when we talk about Larry Summer, 5% unemployment, perhaps more over the coming years. How does that all fit together? And, and uh, Lisa, I'm doing, I'm triangulating. What you do, folks, with foreign exchanges, you triangulate. You don't just talk about yen or dollar yen, and obviously euro yen uh, moving up. Stronger euro, weaker yen here with a 136 level. I'm looking as well, uh, Lisa, at Aussie yen, which I think is misunderstood, whether it's Newcastle coal out of New South Wales, Australia, or it's cases of swan beer out of Perth, Australia. The fact is we haven't gone through to strong Aussie weekend yet. 
I just go back to the person who told you that you pronounced Perth right, Perth. <laughs> and so you're going to keep saying it as much as possible to sort of relive the glory, Perth. I hope you my know, badge <laughs> works is what I'm looking for. <laughs> but we are looking right now at a very changed dynamic. What's the pressure point going to be for the yen? What does Neural Rubini say? 140 <clears throat> uh, for wow. the yen. I don't, I don't think they want to be bullied. I don't think that they're going to say, okay, we give up. Mea culpa. You know, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not buying that right now. I'm buying that we're going to give you the continued data check here with futures up 52, and we are watching the historic weak yen. This is Bloomberg on Radio on Television. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Elon Musk sees a recession in the U.S. in the near future. The Tesla and SpaceX CEO spoke to Bloomberg News Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite. A recession is inevitable at some point. Um, as to whether there is a recession in the near term, um, I think that is more likely than not. Uh, it certainly isn't, a, it's not a certainty, but um, it appears more likely than not. The interview with Musk was part of the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha, powered by Bloomberg. President Biden says he hopes to decide this week whether to move to suspend the federal gasoline tax. That could ease the impact of soaring prices at the pump. The move likely would require congressional sign-off and could not be taken via executive action. U.S. gas prices now average $4.98 a gallon. That is just short of the record set last week. Russia warns that two Americans captured whilst fighting for Ukraine could face the death penalty. A spokesman for President Vladimir Putin tells NBC they weren't likely to be protected by the Geneva Conventions as prisoners of war. Moscow considers the Americans so-called soldiers of fortune and not part of the Ukrainian army. In the UK, the biggest rail strike in three decades is underway. Unions rejected a last-minute offer from train companies. Some 40,000 workers are walking out today, Thursday and Saturday. That's bringing commuter services to a halt and threatening to cause transport chaos in London. And Kellogg says it will split into three independent companies. They include Global Snacking, North American Cereals and Plant-Based Foods. The maker of Frosted Flakes and Fruit Loops says the move will give each business a better opportunity to grow. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month and all year long. I don't see a Paul Volcker out there. Paul Volcker said, you know, dang it, I gotta, I gotta bring inflation down. The only way that's gonna happen is if I let interest rates go up to whatever level it takes to cause a recession and bring inflation down. And, and history does show, uh, certainly U.S. history shows, that uh, the most effective way to bring inflation down is to have a recession. A really hard recession will do it for sure. Our conversation of the day on the economics that you're living, Edward Yardeni, of course, at Yardeni Research with decades of experience, he was blistering there on this compare and contrast foolishness to the era of uh, Paul Volcker. Uh, some housekeeping right now as you look at markets on the move. Lisa, help me here. Uh, Stephen Gallo out at BMO Capital Markets just reaffirms weak euro to 102, which I think is really remarkable. When you combine weak yen, weak euro, I think that means strong dollar. Well, and that goes to the Eddie Ardenny point. How much conviction is there for the Fed to keep going, even as the dollar continues to strengthen? And I think about what Russ Kostrich said, which was the long dollar call was their main hedge against stocks. Does that keep working, given some of the pressure that people feel if unemployment rates start to tick up, Tom? And also, yen weakness here. And it's not just against the dollar. On radio, we're going to... My tie is a mess. Come on. Someone on radio, help me with my tie here. <laughs> They're clamoring uh, the, to help. The, uh, the, I know. The, the issue here is it's not just about dollar. Euro, yen is yeah. what the pros look at. And the fact is we're almost through to new strength there. 143.72 gets us out near that 145 level. And that's yen weakness, Lisa. Dollar, euro. And I'd also mention from Sydney to Perth, the Australian dollar as well. <laughs> 
<laughs> you did that wonderfully. Tom. Thank you. Very, very good. Uh, I will just note that Paul McNamara, who's been in this market for decades, right. noted that uh, on Twitter, he said, for people younger than me in 1998, the last time we saw this level on the yen, the yen bounced back 22 percent in less than three months. That actually required policy that's, intervention. That's the incoming of the day. Yeah. And do wow. we end up with the same kind of policy intervention? Right. What will it take to get there? And Lizanne Saunders Schwab out on Twitter with a great chart from Redfin showing the price decreases that Redfin studies and housing have really sped up. There's some uh, at least price decrease growth in housing uh, to oil. Kevin Book with us, Managing Director, Clearview Energy Partners. And Kevin, I want to link in here weaker yen in the import ramifications of Japan and others which is the research over the weekend on what Russia is doing with their hydrocarbons. They are moving it to India. They are moving it through the Straits of Malacca, up the Pacific Rim to other places, maybe to Japan. I'm not going to speak for that, to China, whatever. What part of the Russian oil movement has your attention with Clearview Energy's global perspective? Morning, Tom. Uh, first and foremost, the amount that China is buying. It's that strong alliance between China and Russia uh, that really shelters the Russian barrel right now. India, notable for its growth, but China for its volume. Uh, second is that the products uh, don't necessarily have the same home. Those are big refining destinations, China and India. So take crude, they're fine, uh, but they've got products uh, they've made of their own. And uh, so they don't need as much of the refined product. That just, just disappears if it can't find a market. Kevin? I want to ask you all these sophisticated questions, but really I just want to know how high gas prices can potentially go in the United States, given some of the calls out of J.P. Morgan and the like for $6 a gallon uh, gasoline. Look, did you think we were going to be at five right now? I think a lot of people are, are re revising their expectations. We're one hurricane or one major refinery outage away uh, from a significant uptick on its own. With that, we have crude structurally aiming higher. Uh, if you see real insurance sanctions go into force, I don't know how price caps are going to work just yet. Uh, a little skeptical that that even works in, in the end. Uh, and so the, the sanctions the EU put in place uh, threatened to squeeze crude even a bit more before the year ends. Uh, and so now you've got crude going up. You've got risks to the refining side. Uh, $6 is not unreasonable. So what's the what's the pressure reliever here, given that we've heard about taxes and removing certain gas taxes, that that probably won't do anything. If anything, it'll actually cause prices to go higher because it will uh, increase demand or allow demand to keep climbing. What do you see as a policy prescription to cap prices where they are, or send them lower? Well, you just had a gas to prescribed recession. I suppose uh, nothing solves high prices like high prices, except also slow growth. Uh, but the administration is looking at options that are really at the sort of the, the dwindling end of the options set. They've already drawn the SPR. Uh, they've already considered products reserves, which aren't very big. Now they're looking at things like uh, product export limitations, not necessarily outright bans, but caps, keeping products home. Uh, that could have deleterious consequences. Yes, a gasoline price, uh, gasoline tax holiday. Uh, but as you suggested, that could induce demand or at least preserve it. Uh, and ultimately, the, the things that could put an immediate relief in price or sort of outside of the administration's environmental comfort zone. So things like waiving air quality standards uh, for, for vapor pressure, uh, that doesn't look like something they're going to do. Well, to that point, this is an administration that came into office with a climate agenda that has been trying to lead a global charge toward decarbonization and cleaner energy. <clears throat> if you're leading an oil company, why would you invest in more refineries or ramping up your production capacity, knowing that the, at the end of the day, people want to phase out fossil fuels? Yeah, drill today, disappear tomorrow is not an investment thesis. Uh, one last fossil bender before America goes green and sober is not going to convince capital discipline to loosen. Hmm. Uh, it, it is really a difficult proposition to talk about transition and also ramping at the same time. Well, Kevin, are you predicting $6 a gallon gas? I mean, can I narrow it down to that? Lisa, I'm, I'm asking for a friend. Lisa wants to know. We don't predict prices at Clearview. We predict directions and we've got room to the upside. That's his way of saying, probably. I think he <laughs> no. said, I, I think we can do the banner. But <laughs> early. Maybe. Yeah, okay. Kevin, thank you oh. so much. Greatly appreciate it. As he predicts, we're all going to be driving VW diesels here uh, within uh, weeks. He's with Clearview Energy Partners. But that's an important point, uh, Lisa, that, you know, in the old days, it was a VW diesel, a golf, as Farrell calls it. What, what is that? But anyways, the point is, diesel's more expensive now 
than gas. Yeah, and part of that has to do with the um, inelastic mm. demand. Truck drivers have no choice. They have to use diesel in the United right. States, and so they can't be as price conscious. It's not that people are going to necessarily give up their diesel cars. Mm. They already have, right. and that's a real issue. Okay, I want you to stay with us, folks, through the next 30 minutes. We have Pooja Sriam with us with Barclays, their U.S. economist. And then I am thrilled to tell you moments ago, Dr. Thin agreed to join us. When Thin will join us from Brown Brothers Harriman on this historic day, the weakening of the Japanese yen. Lisa, 136.14 now, that's a full figure. That's a, that's a huge move. The pressure is building, and the Bank of Japan is trying to resist it, but the pressure is building. At what point does this become the bad kind of inflation on steroids right. when they have to go out, import goods, and have to pay a whole lot more in yen for them? Well, we will see, and many others uh, uh, are writing in right now. We'll continue to watch uh, BMO Capital Markets as well. Push your serum with us. Uh, they're U.S. economists at Barclays. Looking forward to that on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television. Futures up 57, Dow futures up oh, 420, not as much as earlier, but still a nice lift to the NASDAQ, up 1.6%. Please stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Just say good morning to you. An eventful Tuesday all of a sudden. First of all, crypto. Kaylee, what time is crypto? I'm sorry. It's in the middle of the surveillance nap. 1 p.m. Eastern time. 1 p.m. Eastern time. It. Crypto 21,000, a little bit off the game I'm today. I'm looking but forward to it. Nice well, yeah, thank you. Nice, uh, Anytime. <laughs> nice, nice recovery here from 17,000. Lines driving crypto down over the weekend. <laughs> We're also watching Yen. Win Thin, Lisa, is going to join us from Brown Brothers Harriman here on Yen 136. How much does this uh, exemplify the stress? And I, I'm curious to yeah. hear what he has to say <clears throat> about this versus a specific story about policy divergence. Does this highlight uh, the channels that are allowed to express some of the concern in markets about a recession <clears throat> and about a, the inability for central banks yeah. to stop from raising rates to the expectations of the market? We'll be watching that. And of course, that does mean a resilient dollar. We're going to rip up the script here with Pooja Shrim. She's U.S. economist at Barclays, but obviously with the parchment from LSE is always dollar and foreign exchange based is a litmus paper of the system. Let's go from weak yen out to strong dollar. How does a resilient dollar or strong dollar change the degrees of freedom that Jerome Powell has? Well, um, thanks for having me, Tom. Uh, a strong dollar is, is definitely something that is favorable for import prices. Um, it's, uh, it should help uh, in the long term to try and relieve some pressure, at least from imported inflation. So, um, But you know. President Trump would say we need to bring the dollar down to spur exports. We haven't heard that from President Biden, at least so far. I mean, give me the export side of that discussion. Well, um, it's, it's true that um, a stronger dollar would be um, slightly uh, unfavorable for net exports, but I think the focus right now is on taming inflation pressure. So from that point of view, uh, we think a stronger dollar strong is, good is absolutely. Keeps lesser down. Absolutely. Well, but Pooja, going to Yardeni's point, there is no Volcker. They are not going to raise rates into a recession. They don't want to trigger a recession. Is that an accurate characterization of what you expect from the central bank? Well, uh, absolutely. I think no central bank wants to engineer a recession. Uh, but from what we saw in their uh, summary of economic projections, from what we heard from Chair Powell, I think they are acutely aware that there is likely to be some pain to the economy uh, if they wish to bring uh, price pressures under control. And I think uh, what they showed us uh, through the 75 basis point rate hike uh, in the June FOMC and what their hawkish dot plot shows us is they're willing to sort of push the limit a little over here uh, to try and, and get expeditiously to neutral uh, and even if that comes at the cost of slightly lower growth and slightly more unemployment, I think that's a chance that they're willing to take at this point in time. All right. So if you go there to the dot plot and the projections, we have to also go to what some people have called fantasy land. Uh, this idea of unemployment remaining fairly muted into the future, even though we do have this hawkish tilt. What is the breaking point for the Federal Reserve, for policymakers more broadly in terms of the unemployment? 
unemployment rate at a time when you've got the likes of Larry Summers projecting 5% unemployment for five years needed to bring inflation down? Yeah, it's, it's, I think uh, they are in a tough spot um, that the trade off between, you know, achieving price stability as well as full employment, that's becoming increasingly challenging. Um, and I think uh, we are in a tough inflation environment. Um, I do agree to your point that, uh, you know, the projections that they've laid out uh, in, in their uh, summary over there do seem a little optimistic. You know, some might call it a rosy picture. Um, aspirational even. Um, but uh, I think what the Fed is likely to look at going forward is how the data evolves. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's a message that Chair Powell has given us multiple times. So I think that's going to be their focus um, as of now. Well, what data will they be looking at between now and July when they're deciding between 50 and 75? Yeah, so we get a whole host of uh, data points, in fact, between now and July. But I would say top of the list would definitely be in the June um, CPI inflation print. Um, they will, you know, see signs of whether inflation pressures continue to accelerate, um, you know, across core categories particularly. Um, the University of Michigan's inflation expectations print is going to be another important indicator that they will look at. And then, of course, we have the employment report uh, that comes in at the beginning of the month. And, you know, outside of that, I think uh, they, they will also continue to look at some of how, you know, some of the other data points in terms of how retail sales evolve, what's happening to housing. For example, we get a bunch of home sales data um, and, you know, we're getting the sense that uh, housing is beginning to feel the pinch of tighter financial conditions. So I think mm -hmm. it's going to be a whole set of these data points that they will keep an eye on. Um, and, you know, that's what they're likely to deliberate on before making their policy decision. To focus in on the inflation expectations data point in particular, because Powell cited that directly in the press conference last week, saying we saw that University of Michigan number, and that is partly why we decided to move 75 basis points, not wait six weeks to do so. And we heard Jim Bullard of the St. Louis Fed over the weekend talking about the risk of inflation expectations running away, getting out of control. How large of a credibility problem does this Federal Reserve have right now? And what is the likelihood you place around something like that happening? Well, I think credibility was, um, you know, probably an issue that they were concerned about going into the June FOMC meeting. And I think that's the reason why they did such a statement hike and, you know, mm -hmm. they did that uh, hawkish shift to their dot plot. Uh, but, you know, having done that, I think to some extent they have been successful in sort of reinstating credibility around um, their price stability mandate. Um, as of now, um, you know, inflation expectations still look reasonably well anchored. Yes, the move up um, in the University of Michigan print was a cause for concern. Um, but right now, that doesn't seem to be running away. This is critical. I mean, July 27th, and Barclay says there's a reluctance to do 75 beaks back to back. That puts you in a, 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 you know, a less hawkish camp, I guess is how I put it, not so much dovish camp. How close are they to their comfortable neutrality, not some fancy Taylor rule or statistical ballet, but how, I mean, if it's nonlinear, how close are they to the point where they're aware it's nonlinear and there's a huge impact? Is it now? Is it the fall? Is it next year? Um, I think they're, they're getting there. They're, they're getting, getting there. Yeah, okay, they're, fine. Getting, they're getting there close to, to their <clears throat> you know, uh, estimate of the neutral rate. And like you said, we are slightly below consensus in that we are calling you know, for a 50 basis point hike in, in July. And we think right now um, we are seeing signs that tighter financial conditions are likely weighing on economic activity already. Um, we think that these signs are likely to intensify yeah. as we get into the July meeting. <clears throat> and, um, you know, maybe the Fed is likely to conclude that policy is yeah. possibly inching into restrictive territory already. And Lisa, I've been remiss on this. I'm sorry, folks. The Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, which is really, really a good series, thank you, Michael Rosenberg and team, is one standard deviation down today. It's a negative 1.06, uh, Lisa, which is germane to the Barclays point. Things are tightening, and you see that in mortgage rates exemplified <laughs> there probably more than anywhere else at 6%. Pooja, how much buying power does the consumer still have? One of the biggest questions has really been the power of the consumer. And we've heard about how they are so strong and their balance sheets are terrific. Are they really that good right now? Um, well, 
to the to your point, yes, household balance sheets still look reasonably, you know, healthy. Uh, we still estimate that excess savings that they accumulated over the course of the pandemic are still about two and a half trillion dollars. Um, but uh, we are seeing signs that consumers are likely pulling back uh, on spending. Uh, we think the momentum in consumption spending is slowing. We see that in the retail sales data, for example. Uh, we track some high-frequency credit card data, and we we've seen signs that uh, you know slow spending has slowed across goods and services. And then you know to your point, the savings rate has also dropped well below um, pre-pandemic levels. So you know even despite the fact that they do have you know. Uh, decent balance sheets to rely on. It looks like they are becoming a little hesitant uh, about spending, and I think eroding purchasing power is a key concern among consumers right now. Apurita, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Pooja Sriram with us with Barclays this morning. Lisa, the, the, the publications right now on yen are coming fast and furious. Sarah Vellos over at Deutsche Bank moments ago recapitulates what he did, it seems like ages ago, I think it was seven days yeah. ago, and it's absolutely stunning how the Bank of Japan is on, and it's a cliche, folks, but on original territory here. It's in, just stunning. So in order to keep the yield curve control that they've committed themselves to, they've been buying an unprecedented <clears throat> amount of bonds. It was something like $2 trillion, uh, 2 trillion yen of uh, debt yeah, at the last auction. It's meaningless. What he says is that the monthly run rate of buying by the Bank of Japan is now double the pace of buying at peak Abenomics, Abenomics at around 20 trillion yen of government Bonds. This, to me, really shocked me. It is the GDP equivalent of the Fed doing $750 billion <clears throat> of monthly quantitative easing in the United States. That is what is required to keep their commitment to ultra-low rates. In a legging up here, as Anderson and Gallo at Bank of Mont uh, Montreal say, BMO, uh, right now, two standard deviation move weaker yen leases at 138, 137.96. So uh, we're moving fast and furious. At what point does this become the canary in the coal mine, mm -hmm. as you said, the Wait, sort of stress? Wait, wait. And at what point does the Fed get concerned about the strength of the dollar? What's going on, Tom? I thought BitDog was the canary in the coal mine. Yeah, what would that mean? I don't know. Kayla, do we have any idea how you're going to attack crypto today? We're going to take a in the coal. Nice are you, are you, That was great, Tom. Are you going to interview yeah. the canary in the coal? <laughs> Bit dog killed the canary. <laughs> no, we're going to take a look at the technicals here because this really matters for this asset class in particular. We've seen certain levels like that were supposed to be support broken over the weekend, yet a rebound taking shape today. So what do the charts tell us about whether or not that rebound is ultimately right. going to be sustainable if this is an actual bottom that is formed in formed in the cryptocurrency market has enough deleveraging happened already that you aren't going to see that kind of forced selling pressure we've seen over the right. last week or so all questions that we want answers to 1 p.m eastern time we'll try to get some lisa i got a bit of pushback on the dalio comments this is mr dalio publishing in bridgewater stagflation and then you see puja just pushing against that just saying no they're gonna they're gonna have to slow things down i thought you were gonna push back from bit dog eating your canary no. next year. But, no. Well, we're going to talk about that in terms of the push-pull of what the Fed's going to do coming up on the open with Kevin Holt, who's chief investment officer over at Invesco. How much have we already priced in, Tom? To me, is one of the key questions. This is Bloomberg. Stay with us next. We look at the Japanese yen. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. President Biden has reiterated that a U.S. recession is not inevitable. Biden spoke to reporters after a conversation with former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers. Summers says there's a significant chance the U.S. will find itself battling stagflation. In China, the coronavirus outbreak is shifting to its south coast. A flare-up in Shenzhen has triggered mass testing and a lockdown of some neighborhoods. Meanwhile, gambling hub Macau is racing to stop its first outbreak in eight months. Bloomberg's learned that the European Union's 27 members are set to formally grant Ukraine candidate status later this week. That is a highly symbolic step on the long path to becoming an EU member. EU leaders will discuss Ukraine's membership bid this week. And the blank check company Gors Guggenheim will formally merge with Swedish electric vehicle maker Polestar on Thursday. Shares will start trading 
On the Nasdaq, the next day, the transaction is expected to raise at least $850 million in gross proceeds. And Elon Musk says there are still a few unresolved matters regarding his proposed acquisition of Twitter. He told Bloomberg News Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite at the Qatar Economic Forum there is the question of whether the debt portion of the deal comes together and then whether shareholders vote in favour. Musk is still waiting for a resolution on the matter of how many bots are on the platform. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. If the yen keeps on falling, it's going to fall more given the divergence between BOJ policy and other central banks. At some point, inflation is going to become a problem for the BOJ and they're going to give up on that zero policy rate. If you go well above 140, the BOJ will have to change policy. And the first change in policy is going to be to change the yield control curve policy and go above 0.25 on the JPGs. It is what we try to do each and every day at Bloomberg Surveillance. When news breaks, we can go worldwide with Bloomberg from Doha and the Qatar Economic Forum. Nora Rubini this morning modeling out 140 as weak yen is a point of breaking for the Bank of Japan. Of course, with Rubini Macro Associates and someone who's helped us out so much over the years. Helping out as well with a visual here, perfect for radio, Kriti Gupta on weak yen. Yeah, well, if... Uh, Noriel Rubini called for 140, Tom. Well, we're already at 136. Of course, it's the highest uh, levels that you've seen for dollar yen going all the way back to 1998. When Remember, we did have that coordinated currency intervention. When I say coordinated, I mean the United States was on in on it. Europe was in on it as well. Do we see that coordinated reaction again? Here's the problem with that. Two things. One, you're looking at a $4 trillion daily turnover market. And two, you're also looking at a race to a strong currency. What's the incentive for currency intervention? Which really brings me to my Part of the day here. That's what's making traders extremely nervous. We're looking at implied volatility. One week implied volatility for dollar yen. For our radio audience, what you need to know is it is a straight shot up when you look at the regression from that December low to where we are now. And once again, uh, Tom says this all the time, it really is that rate of change that matters. But Lisa actually talks about bond auctions so much in the United States. I got to bring the bond auction from Japan here, seeing their right. worst bond auction for their five year since, get this, March of 2020. It's the fear is that the bond market or the JGB market is going to break. How much further right. can the currency really handle, Tom? Kriti Gupta, thank you so much. He is with Brown Brothers Harriman, is head of global currency strategy, but far more. He is definitive on the international relations, his work at Brandeis and on to Columbia as well. Wynn Thin joins us now in the span of the Pacific Rim and what it means for Tokyo. Wynn Thin, I'm going to go back to a September of 1992 where George Soros made history with the breaking of the Bank of England. Who right now is trying to break the Bank of Japan? Well, it, uh, first of all, thanks again for having me. It's, it's always a pleasure. Uh, I, I do I say I, I do admit that I, I love this uh, 845 slot more than 630, uh, FYI. <laughs> so anyway, does Lisa, oh, anytime, but you know, she's awake by then. No, continue. Call me, call me anytime, honestly. Anyway, here's the interesting thing. It, it's the... It, the, the, the markets are testing the Bank of Japan uh, yield curve control as opposed to the currency. I mean, the currency is obviously a byproduct of this whole system. But uh, we've been hearing reports, obviously, covered by, your, by uh, Bloomberg and other uh, financial reporters that a lot of hedge funds are going short JDBs uh, on the assumption that it's, the Bank of Japan cannot hold the yield curve control. Uh, you know, to me, I think they can sustain this. I mean, I, you know, I, I said this, I think, on my last appearance uh, a week or so ago, is that you know, if there's dislocations in the JGB market, some arbitragers and speculators, you know, get dislocated. I think the, the Bank of Japan is going to accept that. The, the Bank of Japan right now is getting two things that they've been trying to for, for decades, and that's a weak yen and higher inflation. And I think if you look at the official comments, especially from Governor Kuroda, they don't want to pull the plug early. Um, any sort of uh, reversal on this easy monetary policy, could easily see the uh, dollar yen fall 10, 15, 20 big figures. It's anyone's guess. 
But that is the real fear from the, from the po Japanese policymakers, why they are maintaining the current policy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we don't see a policy shift from the Bank of Japan or uh, other sorts of intervention, is there a path to a stronger yen, an alternate scenario? Uh, unless uh, they, until and un unless they change their monetary policy stance, I, I think it's a one-way bet. Um, you know, again, I keep bringing this up, but I, I admire uh, Professor Robert Mundell so much. But uh, his work back in the '60s, this is during the, the era of fixed exchange rates. But he basically had uh, set forth what he called the impossible trinity: that is, a country cannot have open capital flows, independent monetary policy, and target the exchange rate. And as long as the Bank of Japan continues to run ultra loose policy, this monetary policy divergence is really the, the major driver across most FX markets, particularly here uh, for dollar yen. And you know that's the thing; they they had a chance last Friday to make a statement and perhaps you know step back from this, but they went double down pretty much and went full in on this. And they can't be surprised that dollar yen is up here. This is the, the, again the natural byproduct of their easy money policy. Okay, so if we widen it out and look at Asia more broadly, how, for example, is Beijing likely to look at this week again? Well, if, actually, it's funny you bring that up. Uh, it, it, interesting, because uh, if you talk about monetary policy divergence, I think that's another story uh, with the Bank, People's Bank of Japan. They're uh, actually in easy mode. Um, Japan, Bank of Japan is, is in easy mode, but sort of staying steady. But uh, People's Bank of Japan is actually easing. So to me, that's another uh, signal for dollar yen to go higher as well. Um, this is, again, a natural byproduct, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's something I think we'll continue to see. When we're out of time, we've got to get you back here to discuss this. And, of course, we do it with uh, many on the street looking for continued weakness in, yeah, uh, in yen. Dr. Thin is with Brown Brothers Harriman in New York. Kaylee, I got 18 things to talk about, but I got to pitch the crypto show. Mm -hmm. Tuesday, today, is Matt Miller in the building? Is he going to be with you on this, Kaylee? Of course he is. 1 p.m. Eastern time, he'll be joining me. We have a lot to discuss uh, today, Tom. Do we have a why it went down this weekend? Do, I, mean, I mean, it's not like Kellogg's where it goes down or goes up because they have a press release. Was there a press release that moved BitDog down this weekend? It's always hard to understand the drivers in this asset class in particular because it is historically so volatile and clearly that isn't something that has changed recently. It's actually become more so. But the, a lot of the conversation was that oh, this was forced selling taking place, that you saw one event happening in May with the collapse of Terra USD, then you saw Celsius freezing uh, holdings, add on the broader, or withdrawals rather, add on the broader macroeconomic environment of tightening policy policy of money no longer being freed, liquidity being less yeah. abundant, all of that caused a lot of selling pressure. The question is, is the, the rebound we're seeing uh, over the last couple of days, one that's going to stick around, that's something we'll be digging into later on How this afternoon. How are the beautiful Tom. people rationalizing this? The gazillionaires that are like three weeks out of school and they've made more money than any of us will make combined in our lifetime. And uh, their, their wallet's a little lighter this morning, isn't it? Oh, yeah. The, billion, the crypto billionaires, the likes of Mike Novogratz or CZ over at Binance. CZ? Have had, CZ. Does he know Jay-Z? <laughs> Good question. I bet he does. Jay-Z's in on crypto as well. Jo uh, why, specifically why did financial. I know that? <laughs> <laughs> no, he and Jack Dorsey actually are bringing financial education about Bitcoin uh, to certain housing projects. So that financial literacy conversation, obviously something entirely Wait different. But yes, Tom, to your point, there's a lot of big names and evangelists in this space. By and large, the faithful stay faithful. Tell me Ed Sheeran's not into crypto. That I don't know, Tom. You should you should ask him. I, See I if he'll come on the show to talk about I don't it. Know. Well, you know, I, I, crypto, this is what, an hour program or do you go out two hours and extended crypto? It's only 30 minutes, but if you'd like to talk to management about extending it and be an advocate, be my guest, I would guest, be an Tom. advocate for that. <laughs> Seriously, it was really interesting to see. I watched the, the move to 17-ish this yeah. weekend, like I watched the end of Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns. Every tick was absolutely fascinating on the Bloomberg. Crypto right now, BitDog rather, 20, I call it Tulip Coin, I'm sorry. 21,084 on Bitcoin, and you could see it and believe it on crypto this afternoon. Please stay with us, an eventful day. Japanese yen weakens.